Today, we live in the world of tomorrow. We are prepared by the momentum of our dreams. We are driven by the forces of technology, innovation, and... A very good afternoon to our distinguished guests, delegates, my seniors, and dear colleagues. I am delighted to welcome you all to the second Oncology Conclave, which is being organized by Dhyanan Medical College and Hospital Cancer Care Center in collaboration with American Oncology Institute. It gives me great happiness to see you all gathered here for this conclave, giving the time out of your busy schedule, and I would like to thank you for here with us today. The theme for the second oncology conclave is the deliberation on latest advancements in cancer treatment, focusing on prostate and ovarian, the capabilities and limitations of radiotherapy, bone marrow transplant in malignancy. So over the next two days, we will be seeking new ideas and new ways of doing things. Problems will be addressed in the hope of seeking solutions for which we have brilliant spectrum of speakers, panelists, and chairpersons whom I welcome once again. I also welcome here the members of the media, print and digital, for enhancing interest in covering the event and making it a success. So not taking much of your time, I would like to welcome you all once again and get started with the sessions and be ready for the tsunami of ideas. Thank you so much and for, with this I welcome or I ask doc, Dr. Vineet to start with the sessions. Thank you so much. A very good afternoon to all present. So based on the proven clinical benefits we've observed on the patients themselves, the genetic information can be used as a measure of primary prevention for ovarian cancer and it is therefore critical for their family relatives. Starting the conclave with our first discussion, the topic for which is role of molecular testing in ovarian cancer. The time for all the speakers will be 20 minutes. We'll be ringing the first bell at 15 minutes and the second final bell at 20 minutes, please. And the time for discussion post the uh, speaker is 10 minutes. I invite the respected chairpersons on stage, please. Dr. Raman Arora, Senior Medical Oncologist of Oswald Hospital, Ludhana, Dr. Harpreet Puri, 
Head of the Department, Department of Pathology, Dean TMCH Ludhiana, Dr. Navjot Bajwa, Head of the Department, Department of Molecular Genetics, TMCH Ludhiana, Dr. Pankaj Arora, Associate Director, Department of Radiation Oncology, Max Mohali, Dr. Rupali Agarwal, Senior Consultant, Gracian Hospital Mohali, Dr. Gursimran, Consultant, Surgical Oncology, Apollo and Chandigarh City Hospital, I now request our chairpersons to introduce our speaker to for the session, please. Good afternoon, everybody. This is something good that we are paying attention to what server has come in recent past. Any conference is a place where we can educate each other, learn from our experiences, faults and successes too. World of oncology is changing a lot. Including this basic benchmarks are also changing. The way drugs are being approved. A lot of these things are going to affect us. Same holds true for the pathology. So many things are taking place. Are we well equipped as a clinician or we need more number of experts to manage our patients. Or it is going to be a team effort and team members are going to grow big. In the same questions, I invite Dr. Sunil Pasricha, who is a senior consultant pathology at Rajiv Gandhi Cancer Institute, New Delhi. This is his second decade of experience there. We listen to all what he has to educate us about this. Thank you. Pancone anemia pathway or otherwise which are involved in the homologous recombination. 
So definitely there is a felt need for improving the prevention and early detection as disease diagnosed at an early stage has a five-year relative survival rate that exceeds 90% and to improve the therapeutic strategy for the advanced and recurrent disease. And that can be achieved by understanding the molecular landscape because the knowledge about the molecular alterations in the ovarian cancer can allow for a more personalized diagnostic, predictive, prognostic, therapeutic strategies for the patient and they also have a clinical implications for the family members. So coming to the molecular and genetic testing, so the most important and the relevant at this time is the homologous recombination repair and the deficiency. So this is uh, uh, a symbolic representation of the various types of the DNA damage and the repetitive pathways. So if there is a single strand break, uh, break so the, they, they are managed by the base excision repair involving the part. And if there is a adduct or crosslink, so they are repaired by the nucleotide excision repair, which is involves the polymerases. Then you have DNA replication error that are being taken care by mismatch repair genes, MLH1, MSH2, MSH6, and PMS2 mainly. And for the double strand breaks, we have a two, uh, two uh, repetitive pathway that is a homologous recombination and non homologous end joining. So, coming to the homologous recombination repair, the DNA damage is repaired by multiple interconnected pathways. And HRR, that is a homologous recombination repair, they represent a central and high fidelity DNA damage repair system, which is responsible for the reparation and restoration of the DNA double strand breaks and interstrand crosslinks. It works in a slow, specific complex, but in a very accurate fashion. So many genes are involved, and we know at least 15 essential ones, the repair, which repair the DNA double strand breaks, gaps, and is an error-free pathway. And why it is so accurate? Because it uses a system provided as a template to maintain the genomic stability and brings the DNA back to its pristine state. So the genes involved are classified into three basic sets. One is the sensor, the mediator, and the effector. So initially, the recognition of the double strand breaks is recognized by the sensor genes. The most important is the ATM and ATR that activates the BRCA1, which recruits the other proteins which are required for the DNA and rejection. And finally, it's the BRCA2 and PALV2 that actually recruits and loads the RAT51, which carries out the further, the and, and it gives a DNA repair and leads to error-free repair. So what is the now homologous recombination deficiency? So it is the actually functional defects in the HRR. And what are the consequences that it leads to now, since the homologous recombination repair is not possible, so now it, it le leads to an over-reliance of the double strand break repair on the non-homologous end joining, which actually represents a low fidelity and an error-prone alternate DNA repair system. So that uh, ECGA project has described that 50% of the high-grade serous ovarian carcinoma, they exhibit homologous recombination def deficiency, and the loss of function mutations and epigenetic modification in the BRCA1, BRCA2 and the other genes which are involved in the HRR pathway. So that leads to unrepaired and inaccurately repaired double strand breaks, subsequently leading to accumulation of the genomic aberrations such as insertion, deletions, copy number, alterations, the structural chromosomal rearrangements and eventually leading to genomic instability and carcinogenesis. And, and in this cascade that leaves behind the footprint that may be detected as genomic scar. Now, HRD is actually a phenotype due to loss of HRR capability associated with genomic scars. However, we don't know it all. HRR is not fully compliant, and so we have to uh, measure the scars of the DNA damage in the form of loss of heterozygosity, which is defined as the presence of single allele, then telomeric allelic imbalance, a discrepancy in the 1 is to 1 allele ratio at the end of the chromosome, and we have a large scale state transition, which are the transition point between the region of abnormal and normal DNA or between the two different regions of abnormality. So all this can lead to copy number variation. So why it is important to talk about the HRD today? Because as a biomarker, HRD holds both predictive and prognostic value in high grade serous ovarian carcinoma. So if we see, like uh, of uh, all the uh, serous ovarian carcinomas, 50% are HRD positive. And of that, in the category of HRD positivity, so we can see 50% are BRCA mutants. So 25% that makes it to the, the whole ovarian carcinoma, but 50% it makes it in the component of HRD positive. Now we have a very important subset, that is one in two patients with HRD positive advanced ovarian cancer who do not have BRCA mutation, but they still have a genomic instability. So HRD testing has a 
predispositional insights, prognostic insights, and most important is the predictive insight. It's a predictive biomarker. So the determination of a validity and relevance is necessary to consider a biomarker's useful in for clinical practice. And for any uh, important biomarker, it needs to have an analytical validity, the clinical validity, and the most important is the clinical utility. That is the likelihood to improve a clinical outcome by using a drug test based on the level of clinical evidence. So coming to the testing of HRD. So no uniformly accepted gold standard for the HRD assessment exists. The present clinical methods for detecting the HRD are limited to assessing for the genomic aberration or perturbations within the tumor that resulting from the mutations within the HRR pathway or by detecting a genomic scar, reflecting the underlying genomic instability. Yet the patient who are found to be HRR proficient or HRD negative, they are also found to respond to bar therapy, the, the, the same problem that we are grappling with the PDL1 testing also. And the implication that current HRD assays are also imperfect, but they are still the best we have in our armamentarium. Just like our uh, Indian cricket team, that one bad day and everyone forgets that it is still the world number one T20 team. So coming to the testing for the HRD, so what we are looking for in what? So three tests are usually offered. One is the HRR uh, gene mutations. The second is the HRD score using the genomic scar. And third, which is the functional HRD assays, which are right now in the pipelines. So for HRR, we look for the mutation in 15 enlisted genes of HRR pathway. Some kids may have more than that, but in all what we are using at RGCI having a 15 genes, we look for the single nucleotide variation, the indels in these genes, we corroborate these with the public database of the somatic and germline mutation, we, and we apply the Association of American Pathology Guidelines and we report. Why for HRD? We take into account the HRR, besides that, we calculate the scores of genomic instability. So these are the commercial assays available, and out of these four, only the two are having the prospectively validated in the trials. One is a uh, foundation on companion diagnostic by foundation medicine and other is a my choice companion diagnostic from Myriad. So this is the uh, Myriad my choice. So it basically, uh, it, it calculates the HRD score or the genomic instability score by summing up the scores of the LOH, TAI and LSE that I have previously uh, alluded to. And in addition, it provides a BRCA1 to mutation and rearrangement analysis within the report and the positive cutoff is 42. The other one is the foundation medicine which calculates the percentage of loss of heterozygosity and the positive cutoff is more than 16%. In addition, the NGS evaluates 315 cancer-related genes including pathogenic mutation in BRCA1 and BRCA2 in its report. And this was used in the ARIEL2 and ARIEL3 trials. So these are the key results from the reported prospective trials which are investigating the HRD status as a biomarker for PARP response and, and also has shown a prognostic utility. So these were the some important trials like Ariel 3, NOVA, study 19, SOLO 2, QUADRA, study 42, study 10. So across various treatment settings in these trials, the subgroup of the patients with BRCA1, BRCA2 mutation consistently retrieved the greatest degree of benefit from PARP inhibitor therapy followed by the subgroup of the patient which are found to be BRCA wild type but having a high genomic instability score or high percentage of loss of heterozygosity which are classified as HRD positive but BRCA wild type. And the, and the least beneficial group was the subgroup of the patient who were BRCA wild type as well as HRD negative, hence they were double negative. And what we are using at RGCI is we are using a customized HRD panel from Kaizen, 50, having a 15 genes. It's a DNA based, can be done on formalin fixed paraffinamide tissue or blood. It, it tells both uh, HRR as well as HRD. And analysis is done on the CLC genomics workbench software. And the cutoff score used is 65. So testing can be done on the, the somatic uh, tissue, that is the tumor tissue, which we know as the tumor profiling, or a germline testing. So for the tumor profiling, it identifies a large number of patients who can be therapeutically targeted and it can serve as a triage for the uh, germline testing depending upon the variant allele frequency that we calculate. Secondly is the uh, germline testing. It is more well established technique because the DNA uh, quality and extraction is easier at is, as it is done on the, the peripheral blood. It carries a prognostic and predictive value and can offer knowledge for the risk of other cancers and allows for the cascade testing. So these are some uh, sample reports, like uh, this was reported just a couple of weeks back at our institute. A 59 year old female having a high grade serious carcinoma, so the tumor fraction was 95% and it has a 
HRT score was 72, so it was a, having a high genomic instability score, 72 positive. However, no clinical significant uh, mutation of the variant detected in the HRR genes evaluated. And the coverage was 1147, ideally the, the threshold of a good coverage is at more than 500. And, and, this way, and, and in the report we incorporate the principles and we uh, describe about the, uh, the, the cutoff that we use, we, we are using the cutoff which has been uh, validated uh, through the provider is that is 65. And these are the genes, list of genes that are analyzed for the SNVs, indels and structural rearrangement. And one has to comment upon the quality matrix that the DNA has passed the quality matrix before the assessment. And these and the table demonstrate the frequency of the deleterious germline and somatic variants in the HRR gene in the ovarian cancer. So these things are listed in the reports. This was another case. CAOGRI, the tumor fraction was 90%, and in this case, there was a variant detected that is a BRIF1, which was a deletion mutation, and the HRD score was 79, which was positive. So coming to the predictive value. So PARP inhibition and tumor selective synthetic lethality. So in a HR proficient cell, what happens is that the homologous recombination, uh, it is, it, it, it's in place and the base oxygen repair through PARP is also in place. So the cell is as fit as fiddle. But in the HR deficient cancer cells, not because even the cancer cells which are proliferating, they are also prone for the, some DNA replication error. So now this cancer cell, which is HR deficient, now it relies only on the base oxygen uh, repair, which is mediated by PARP. And what if we give the PARP inhibitor? I'll explain in a more scientific way. So what happens is then there is a single strand break. It is a PARP mediated base oxygen repair that leads to the repair and leads to survival. And when we give PARP inhibitor, so now PARP mediated base oxygen repair doesn't take place and the single strand break eventually converted to double strand break. So if the cell is HR proficient, it will have a survival, but if the cell is HR deficient, so it will undergo apoptosis and necrosis. So this phenomena is known as synthetic lethality and one might ask that why it uh, uh, why it spares a normal tissue because they have a one intact copy of HR gene which can still repair. So this is the evolution of the various uh, 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 the FDA approvals that were given starting from the first in 2014 for Olaparib with the recent for the Niraparib for the advanced ovarian cancer after response to platinum based chemotherapy regardless of the biomarker status and the Olaparib plus Bevisuzumab for HRD positive advanced ovarian cancer after complete response or partial response to frontline platinum based chemotherapy plus Bevisuzumab. Coming to the prognostic value, so uh, although there is a literature is contentious and this was an important study in which the efficacy of niraparib in the patient with newly diagnosed advanced ovarian cancer after a response to first-line platinum-based chemotherapy was explored. So those patients who received niraparib had a significantly longer uh, progression-free survival than, who, than those who received placebo regardless of the presence or absence of HRD. So if you see this graph, there is a, a prognostic separation of the curve. This is a PFS in the uh, sorry, this is the PFS in the overall population. So one can see there is a prognostic separation of the curves in the niraparib uh, and placebo. And this graph is the PFS survival in the population with HRD deficiency. So here again, the, we can see a good prognostic separation for the uh, patient who, are, who received nira, niraparib versus placebo. And here the separation was much more meaningful in which the PFS was 21.9 months versus 10.4 months for placebo. This was another study to evaluate the prognostic impact of the HRD in which in, in, the, in the upper graph the patients they were divided into the two groups. One is the HRD positive and the negative. So we can see a good prognostic separation of the curves for the positive having the blue curve and the red is the HRD negative. In the lower graph the patients are classified into three groups. One is the HRD positive BRCA mutant which is a blue curve. Then HRD positive BRCA white type which is a red curve. And we can see that these curves showing a good prognostic separation as compared to the green curve, which is a HRD negative. Coming, so coming to the future perspectives, the predictive biomarker for, uh, as a biomarker for immune checkpoint inhibitor, the clinical trials on efficacy of single agent immune checkpoint inhibitor have low response rate. Hence, they have not been approved for the treatment of ovarian cancer apart from subset of patients with MMR deficient tumors. The trials with single agent immune checkpoint inhibitors, Evilumab and Rivilumab has shown a low response rate. 
even combining the uh, has been explored like combining the ingredient checkpoint inhibitors with the dna damaging agent the efficacy of the pembrolizumab and the combination with park inhibitor niraparib was seen in the recurrent ovarian cancer was evaluated in 62 patient in phase 1 and 2 trials the exploratory analysis indicated insights of this testing that is the family screening so recommendation is that all women diagnosed with high grade serious carcinoma ovary should be offered germline genetic testing for braca1 2 and other susceptibility genes If the germline DNA is negative for BRCA mutation, then DNA from the tumor tissue should be sequenced because an additional 5% of the women will have a somatic mutation in the BRCA genes that can be capitalized for the therapeutic challenge. And missing a germline mutation has a grave, grave implications for the family members who may be falsely reassured that they are not at risk. And genetic counseling is very important that provides that actually improves the uh, level of both patient engagement and empowerment. and these are the benefits of the genetic testing for braca1 braca2 the potential benefits of a true negative result includes a sense of relief regarding the future risk of cancer learning that once children are not at risk of inheriting the family's cancer susceptibility and possibility that special checks up the the, the, the checkups and the test or the risk reducing surgeries may not be needed and a positive result may allow the people to make informed decision about their future health care including taking steps to reduce their cancer risk Lastly, the MSI and the MMR gene testing. So, up to 10% of the ovarian epithelial cancers have changes in these genes, especially those which are having a non-serous histology. And the, and this is recommended for the patients who are diagnosed with clear cell carcinoma, endometrioid, adenocarcinoma, or mucinous ovarian cancer. So, what are the indications of the MSI or MMR IC? To so, it is to identify the patient who should be tested for Raine syndrome, as the diagnosis of Raine syndrome can help. Uh, schedule other cancer screening to the patients such as endometrial or colon cancer and also for the family screening and ovarian cancer that might have msi high or deficient mmr gene changes might be treated with immunotherapy drugs especially in the recurrent or metastatic setting as pembrolizumab has been approved in a tissue agnostic fashion for msi high or mmr deficient so to conclude the defects in the gene organ uh, involved in the repair of double strand breaks other than braca1 braca2 also represents a alternative mechanism of hereditary ovarian carcinogenesis recent trials have brought to attention the utility of hrt testing to understand the individualized maintenance treatment options for the patient with advanced ovarian cancer the ngs technologies have provided the opportunity to simultaneously analyze multiple cancer susceptibility genes and actually we need to organize a qualified uh, family cancer clinics where the mutational screening and genetic counseling by ngs should be centralized for the creation of a more comprehensive database for the research guiding the evidence based management thank you so much thank you very much for the nice presentation the presentation is now open for deliberation your questions suggestions observations or any comments please thank you basically hrt takes into account both the things mutation in the genes and the genomic instability score so if the, if there if there is a mutation in the gene that also amounts to a, a deficient hrt it's a deficient so basically hrr is a subset of hrt hrt you look for both hrr that is the defects in the genes that are described in the panel these 15 genes they were it was there Yeah, these are the list. Uh, the gene analyzed for the SNV is indexed and structural rearrangement. The list of the genes. So these genes are analyzed plus the genomic instability score based on the LOH and the telo, uh, telomeric allelic imbalance and the LSTs. So actually, I want to ask: Is this possible that we have a HRT score of more than 42, but still there is no mutation? Means you can have yes, a yes. loss of heterozygosity and other T M R T Y are there, yes. but there is no gene mutation in HRR panel. So yes. HRD will be there still forty two. Yeah, so that's why it shows in these trials also the subgroup of the patient in which there was no definite gene mutation was there, but the score was positive. So they are, they also have a better response as compared to the group of the patient who are double negative. They don't have any mutation in the genes. 
and they don't have any uh, HRD is also negative. Basically, it, it doesn't tell you about the precise etiology, but it tells you about the, the HRD score tells you about the genomic scar, the, uh, uh, that something was wrong in the, uh, the cascade, although it cannot point towards the pinpoint etiology. So in totality, any of the genes like sensor or the other genes yes. which are there, yes. so any of the scores leading to more than 42 will tell us that the prognostic and yeah, predictive. Yes, 42 is for the uh, uh, for the myriad my choice. We are using the Kaizen kit that has a cutoff of 65. So, difference between them? That's a validation. It's a retrospective validation. Like you have a set of patients who have received the, uh, the chemotherapy, or you have the set of the patients who have in which the prognosis is known, and then you apply this in retrospect. And you see at, at, at which cutoff the, the biomarker is giving you a good predictive, like under the ROC curve, you see it like. Just like what PDL one, it was established that, that at various cutoffs it was applied. So at which cutoff the, the prognostic separation is much more meaningful. Thank you for the nice talk, sir. Uh, Thank you. Just uh, wanted to know uh, how old uh, tissue can be used. Like we can use uh, uh, blocks, uh, paraffin blocks for this, but. Is there a cutoff that such an old uh, or one year or two year old will not yield good DNA? One and uh, second was uh, we do use. There are some labs now which are uh, uh, giving uh, free testing opportunities for some of the patients. So in those one of the labs, the cutoff they have. I, I don't uh, know the type of uh, assay they are using, but the cutoff of 50. Uh, in that, so I, I, I'm sure it is not either of these essays. So just your comments on this. And if is there a different type of or the amount of tissue needed is uh, different for like if I have, we have not sufficient <laughs> tissue for HRD, can we at least do HRR in that tissue if somebody is not willing for biopsy? Will that the tissue be a lesser amount of DNA needed or not? So uh, as far as the tissue is concerned, so we are we have done even testing in the five-year-old dogs also. So as far as the primarily when the tissue comes to the histopathology lab, if it upfront if the tissue gets placed in a very optimal way, that there should be if the, the cold is seen at time and everything has been you know taken care of well and you are putting it into that 10% uh, neutral buffer formalin. So there is no problem in doing this testing. But of course, yes, if you compare the germline testing which is done on a peripheral but has a, the DNA yield is much more superior. Because formalin do ex, uh, interferes with the, uh, the, the DNA uh, uh, the cross links and that, that do occur. But yes, if you are doing in an optimal way, so that is not an issue. But as far as the, your third question was that, HRR versus HRD. So it is done on the same tissue only. Same tissue, but uh, more tissue or the DNA So you have to select the, so as a histopathologist, you have to select the, uh, uh, the optimal tissue, you have to go for a, a tumor, uh, that, uh, the tumor enrichment. Suppose in a slide, you are seeing a lot of necrotic or a, uh, you know, a stromal area is there. So you can uh, you can dissect that area, you can take out that area, which is actually so that the tumor fraction increases, like I have shown in my two reports, so in which the tumor fraction was 90%. So you have to choose the section in which the tumor fraction is the largest, so that the DNA yield will be much more better and optimized. Uh, we will one day we will be looking for these epigenetic changes or whether uh, any rational for further treatment. Yes, definitely. If you if you if you uh, see these trials, uh, all the trials that I have mentioned, especially the the, the prima and the aerial, they, they have shown that even the epigenetic modification, especially the methylation of the BRCA genes, even if you see, they they also carry a good predictive and prognostic. Uh, uh, they have a good prognostic uh, reliability. So, so what technique did we use for testing? So uh, we are currently not using for that, but because the data is very scarce for this, so we need more robust studies to come up with a validation. But yes, whatever studies that has been done till date, it has shown that even the epigenetic changes or modifications in the form of methylation of the BRCA genes, they are also they have also have shown a, they are they are corroborating with the high HRDs and they are showing a good prognostic and predictive utility. Dr. Sunil, how in the country uniformity of reports, we do 
listen to lot many comments during our WhatsApp groups within the organization that you have to be aware about what who is reporting. So what is being done in the country for uniformity of the reports? Because we, you may not be approachable to everybody who is sitting in the periphery. So what is the answer to that? So the answer is that whatever essays you are using, sir, that should be actually, should be validated prospectively. That should have been validated in the trials. So only... So within the country, how it is being answered now? Or is it wild variation? Sir, as of now, there is a variation. I do agree. But uh, one has to go with the validated essays. That's the only answer. Thank you. Are there some more questions? Otherwise, I have to thank uh, Dr. Sunil Basricha for such a nice presentation as well as a nice discussion thereof. If there are some questions left, please feel free to discuss with him during the free time. Thank you. Thank you. I thank all my chair persons. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your valuable inputs. I request respected chairpersons to please felicitate our speaker, sir. I also request Dr. Satish Jain, our senior most surgical oncologist from Medivis Hospital, Dr. G.S. Brar, sir, head of the department, surgical oncology, DMCH, to please uh, felicitate our chairpersons, please. So you have to wait for a minute. Dr. Raman Arora. Dr. Harpreet Puri. Dr. Navjot Bajwa. Dr. Rupali Agarwal, and Dr. Gursimran. Thank you all. Moving on, cancer of the ovary represents 30% of all the cancers of the female gelatin organs. An effort to improve survival has led to the introduction of newer surgical and chemotherapeutic approaches and more recently targeted treatments based on molecular and genetic characteristics. So our second topic for today's conclave is current indications of cytoreductive surgery and HIPAC in ovarian cancer. And our and chairpersons for this session are Dr. Veena Jain, our senior most gynae oncologist from Ediways Hospital, Ludhiana, Dr. Shireen Garg, consultant, Department of OBGY, Oswald Hospital, Ludhiana, Dr. Ritesh Pruthi, senior consultant, surgical oncologist from Max Hospital, Ludhi Max Hospital Mohali, and Dr. Romikant Grover, radiation oncologist, Faridkot Medical College, we have Dr. Nishit Srivastav as a chairperson also. He's an assistant professor from Tata Medical Center, Sankru. I request all the chairpersons to please come on the stage.
I request our chairpersons to please introduce our speaker for the day, Dr. Rupendra Sekhumar. In spite of all so many advances being done, still we don't have a good answer. And most of, unluckily, most of our patients when they present in advanced stage only. So one of the uh, way to improve the uh, the results in advanced epithelial ovarian cancer is the introduction of HIPEC, that is hyperthermic intraperitoneal chemotherapy. After the intraperitoneal chemotherapy, hyperthermic chemotherapy has come into existence because the side effects associated with intraperitoneal chemotherapy. Uh, it's my pleasure to invite Dr. Rupinder Sekho with this talk. She is a senior consultant and chief of gynecology oncology at Rajiv Gandhi Cancer Institute, New Delhi. She is our president-elect for Association of gynecology Oncologists of India. Dr. Rupinder Sekho. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Dr. Gina Jen, whom I've known for so many years, and the Gurpreet, whom I've known for perhaps even longer time. Uh, thank you, Dr. Brown. Thank you, Dr. Jen, for having me here. So um, after that um, very confusing, those such an important talk delivered by my colleague, Sunil, uh, let's get on to something more practical. So um, I was given this uh, topic about uh, cytoreductive surgery as well as HIPEC. Both the topics actually they um, are quite vast. I'll try to cover as much as I can quickly. So ovarian cancer, as we know, is the third commonest cancer amongst women in India. Incidence is rapidly rising. And it is um, characterized by aggressive biological behavior. And 70% of it, unfortunately, gets diagnosed in advanced stages where the patient is in poor nutrition and performance status. Most deaths due to, occur due to progression of abdominal disease leading to intestinal obstruction and malnutrition. Pathological types have already been enumerated. High-grade serious carcinoma is the most common of the main subtypes of ovarian cancer and forms about 71% of all epithelial carcinomas. These are a few pictures, real-time pictures uh, of our patients. This is a high-grade serious carcinoma. Sorry, carcinoma. This is a low-grade serious carcinoma, and that is an endometrioid carcinoma. So by just looking at the carcinoma uh, picture, the gross, you cannot really enunciate what exactly you're dealing with. Most of these uh, ovarian cancers, that is 58% of them, they come to us in stage 3, and survival at that point in time is only 21%. Ovarian cancer spreads by um, peritoneal metastasis, and the metastasis, they go along the flow of the peritoneum from the right to the left. So to address this volume disease, it was first of all recognized by Joe Meeks in 1934 and further by Griffiths in 1975. And they thought that the way to address this disease is first take away the washings or ascites, explore the abdomen, do a TH, BSO, and take various biopsies. So that the goal was basically to debulk the tumor. The athletic benefits of cytoreduction are physiologic. It improved bowel function and metabolism. It decreased nausea and vomiting. Removal of large poorly vascularized tumors. It improved chem chemotherapeutic delivery. Increased fraction of G0 cells migrating to higher group fractions, so chemotherapy would be more effective. They decreased the chance of acquired drug resistance. And the goals of cytoreductive surgery were, Griffith said that we should have a minimum of 1.5 centimeter diameter of the tumor tissue left. However, Hacker and Berick said that if the tumor tissue left is less than 5 millimeter, the median survival of patients in this category was 40 months, compared with 18 months for patients whose lesion was 
less than 1.5 centimeters and only six months for patients where the nodule was more than five centimeters. So in this study done by Chi et al. from MSKCC, they analyzed 426 patients and found that age, situs, and residual disease were the most important factors impacting survival. So numerous centers, they have reported increased rates of complete site reduction and safety with aggressive upper abdominal procedures. So that not only should you be doing what was first perpetuated, but you should also be able to do peritonectomy, bowel resection, appendicectomy, liver resection, splenectomy, and all of those if you want to achieve optimal site reduction. Eisenhower and all, they divided this into three groups and they found that in group one, where optimal site reduction was less than one centimeter, with, and this was achieved by doing extensive upper abdominal surgery, both median survival as well as overall survival was much better. So to summarize it, if there is no gross residual disease, the median progression-free survival is 22 months, versus if the gross disease is more than one centimeter, this gets reduced to six months. Role of trained personnel cannot be, cannot be impressed upon more. In high volume hospitals with high volume surgeons, obviously the outcome is much better than where patients are treated at low volume hospitals. Now to see what is a candidate for surgery. Three things are very important. The tumor characteristics, the patient criteria, the surgeon criteria, and of course the infrastructure. What should we assess in a patient? Basically, everything that you would do in a pre-op patient of any kind of surgery, cardiopulmonary function is, of course, very important because we have to remember that all cancer surgeries, there is an extended time frame, and so the patient should be in a good volume in a cardiopulmonary state. The group of Eletti et al., they have identified a subgroup of patients in whom the benefits from aggressive debulking, they do not appear to outweigh the risks. So we have to see which is this group of patients. This very high risk group could be identified by the following three criteria. High tumor dissemination or stage four disease, poor performance status, that is patient with an ASA of more than three, poor nutrition status, which is shown by an albumin level of less than three grams, and if the age is more than 75 years. Some authors have also said that, the, that if the CA125 is higher than 500 international units, perhaps you should defer surgery, but this is a moot point. The next most important thing is the preoperative imaging. This is very important, especially in today's day, when so many patients come to us straight away with a PET scan report. Now, in this diagram, you will see that all the areas which are written in black and white, they can be easily addressed with a little bit of training, and you can remove the, all the disease that is over there. For areas which are in the yellow blocks, you would perhaps require the help of your GI uh, surgeon or even perhaps a urologist because it might require an RA or a lower anterior resection, which perhaps you might not be trained to do, or it may require a urethral replant, re-implant, which of course is better that the urologist may do. But these, all these areas which are in red blocks, please do not address these patients upfront. Perhaps they should be given new adjuvant chemotherapy and subsequently taken up for surgery. Large, dense, confluent disease on subdiaphragmatic uh, regions, they again need to be given uh, chemotherapy first and um, we need to do the surgery later on. So also if there is a disease in the gastrohepatic ligament and the hepatodural ligament and so on and so forth. So to summarize, all peripheral disease, that is all peritoneal disease, whether it is in the paracolic gutter, subdiaphragmatic uh, region, or even on the mesentery can easily be removed. But all central disease, where there is root of the mesentery may be involved, you have to do a rethink. So various other author authors have put forward these very, uh, criteria of where we should operate and where we should not operate. Retroperitoneal lymph nodes above the renal hilum we, uh, are uh, difficult area, so perhaps you cannot address them up front. Perisplenic lesion, small bowel mesentery lesion, root of the uh, superior mesenteric artery, so on and so forth. 
various scores have been put forward. Like if it brought me Asimkov score of under 6, 99% of patients could benefit from complete resection. Laparoscopic scores have also been put forward by Fagotti, where if the score is under 4, a complete cytoreduction reduction can be obtained in 78% of the patients. However, there are many experts who say that laparoscopically you cannot actually be able to identify the root of the mesentery and see other areas. Sometimes you open a patient and then find that this particular patient has a fixed pelvic mass, will require significant bowel resection, which might result in a shortcut syndrome or might require multiple visceral resections. Please do not hesitate to close the patient, send the patient for neoadjuvant chemotherapy and subsequently surgical uh, address. The post-operative complication rate increased with age from 17.1% in those under 50 years to 31.5% in those 80 years or older. The number of extended procedures was also a predictor of morbidity, uh, with complication rates increasing from 20.4% 20, 20 for patients having no extended procedures to 34% and 44% for those having more than two procedures. Anesthesia support, I need not say, is extremely important. It is very useful to have a transesophageal echo to measure the IVC diameter for guiding fluid replacement. Because we know that in most cases of uh, ovarian cancer, there is a lot of fluid shift, and we need to be on top of all of that. Secondary site reduction is controversial. Inconsistent definitions are there. However, in the desktop 3 trial, Du Bois has shown that patients where the PFI is more than 12 months, where there is an isolated site of recurrence, and where you think that the disease is completely resectable, and where ascites is less than 500 ml, these patients do benefit from secondary site reduction. So, it is not important how much you remove, but it is important how much you leave behind. These are a few uh, specimens of ours, end block specimen of uterus with bilateral nexa, with bladder peritoneum and POD deposits. If you are able to do this, then please just go ahead. Omentum can be removed any which way, no matter how bad it is, we can always remove the omentum. Pelvic and parioti lymph node resection, if indicated, should definitely be done and you should do a complete clearance. There are various trials, the Lyons trial which says that you need not remove all lymph nodes and only bulky lymph nodes need to be removed, but that again is a new point. So this is another patient where we did partial uh, liver resection of the left lobe and the other, in the, another patient where we did partial gastrectomy as well as a splenectomy. So you see that upper abdominal surgery is a must because each 10% increase in site reduction correlated with a 5.5% increase in survival. Less than 25% of maximum site reduction showed, gave us a 22.7 month mean in survival and more than 75% Maximum site reduction gives a 33.9 month need in survival. Bad tumor biology, one will easily blame Sunil for all of that, but we have to remember that there is also something known as a surgeon biology. Likelihood of optimal site reduction is a surgeon dependent variable, and we have to remember that the more the tumor that we can remove as surgeons, the better the patient is going to fare. I just skip these slides, I've already told you about the lymph nodes that uh, it is recommended that bulky or grossly enlarged nodes on CT or improv, they can be removed, otherwise we need, we need not remove. So now to summarize all of what I have said. The response to therapy in 1960 was 20 to 25%, and the survival to at that time was 15 to 20%. In 2015, the response to therapy was 70 to 80%, but the survival was still 15 to 25%. Then what happened? This was increased to 40% with radical surgery. That is the upper abdominal surgery. And then after that, we are still stuck where we are. Because of that, we came across this rationale of intraperitoneal chemotherapy, where sustained exposure of high concentration of drug to the tumor tissue was planned. So you see, there is an onion skinning effect what happens is that all the chemotherapy which is given intravenously, there is a high drug concentration in the core of the tumor cells. However, the outer layers, so to say, the drug concentration is very less and the tumor cells, they persist over there. But if these tumor cells are exposed to intraperitoneal chemotherapy for a sustained period of time, then there is a cell kill over there and there is a, so to say, 
and approved survival. So the concept is that long stay in the peritoneal cavity, it will also mean low systemic adverse effect and satisfactory drug concentration in the inner core of the tumor tissue and when we synergize both of these, perhaps the patient fears better. So it was seen that if we give intraperitoneal chemotherapy, the drug concentration in the peritoneal fluid is much more than if we give only intravenous. <laughs> so then what are we going to do? Peritonectomy that I've already told you, that is add multivisceral resections maximum. Add to that intraperitoneal chemotherapy and add to that hyperthermia. And what does all of this become? This becomes your HIPEC. So how do we now do HIPEC? What we do is we first of all assess each patient, see, is this patient fit for, fit for complete cyto reduction? Will we be able to do a complete cyto reduction in this patient? Because we can do HIPEC only if we are able to do a complete cyto reduction. So this was Sugar Baker's PCI system. What he did was the abdomen was divided into nine, nine uh, quadrants and each was given a region and each region site, depending on the uh, measurement, was given a score. Now, if the PCI score is 20 or less, this is a patient where, should, where you should definitely go ahead and try to do maximum cytoreductive surgery followed by HIPEC. If the PCI score is more than 20, then only in cases of pseudomyxoma peritonei or if it is a mucinous tumor should you attempt cytoreduction at all. So this is a scoring CCO0 after you have finished your surgery, that is no visible cancer and so on and so forth. So this is what a patient might look like pre-surgery. And this is these are pictures from all our patients. I'll require a little bit more time because if I have to speak on hyper please. Okay, so hyperthermic intraperitoneal uh, uh, chemotherapy is a technique for delivering a chemotherapeutic agent in which a heated solution of chemotherapy agent is perfused throughout the peritoneal space. It was introduced by Spratt, main apostle was uh, Sugar Baker, and this acronym was coined by the Netherlands Cancer Institute. What are the heat effects? They inhibit RNA, DNA, and protein synthesis. There's a list of cells in certain locations of the cell cycle. There's heat-induced cytoplasmic damage. There's increased lysosomal activation. There's increased anaerobic glycolysis. And there's immunomodulatory role and improves the immune response against tumor cells by inducing heat shock proteins, activating antigen-presenting cells, and lymphocyte migration. What is the rationale of hyperthermia? The combination of heat and the chemotherapeutic agent drugs, they result in increased cytotoxic effect caused by several factors like increased drug uptake in malignant cells, altered cellular metabolism and cellular drug pharm pharmacokinetics, increased drug penetration in tissues, and temperature dependent increase in drug action and inhibition of repair mechanism. Heat has a synergistic effect with certain antimitotic agents, that is cisplatinum, taxol, so on and so forth. Now this synergism between various cytotoxic drugs and hyperthermia, this starts at temperatures of 39 degrees. But it decreases at temperatures above 43 degrees. So whatever chemotherapeutic agent you are exhibiting, the temperature should be between 41 and 43 de degrees. Not less than 39 and definitely not more than 43. As of now, HIPEC is the standard of care in peritoneal pseudomyxoma, in peritoneal and pleural mesotheliomas, in colorectal PSM and limited peritoneal infection, and in ovarian cancer in IDS patients. It is under evaluation for gastric PSM. For gynecological cases, for after interval debulking surgeries, this is the standard of care now and has been introduced in NCCN 2022. It is still under trial for primary debulking surgeries and several people are doing it for recurrent COOV as well. The inclusion criteria include a DFI of more than six months from first treatment. ECOG performance should be zero to two. Patient should be in a stable cardiovascular, pulmonary and other organ functions because this is a major procedure and this is going to take you six, seven hours. Complete resection of the tumor is planned and felt feasible. Technique is you resect all grossly visible disease 
After a section of all gross disease, the abdominal cavity is initially irrigated with normal saline to remove all particulate matter that may block the outflow circuit. To ensure that there is adequate hemostasis prior to hyphic delivery, enteric reconstruction can be done either before or after. Hyperthermia can be generated by various perfusion systems that are available. So this is a diagrammatic representation. You see that there is the perfusion device. Okay, is there a pointer here? Okay, that's fine. So this is the perfusion device, you can see. This is the inflow and this is the outflow. Now these are inflow and outflow pipes. Along with them you have the temperature probes also. So we place two temperature probes with the inflow and two temperature probes with the outflow. Another very important thing is the esophageal temperature probe which is placed by anesthesiologist to detect the core temperature of the patient because it is very important to know the core temperature. And of course the smoke evacuator. So these are, this is just another, these are the tubings you can see, and these are the temperature probes. And so we tie these temperature probes to the tubings. And this is, the inflow are placed below, and the outflow is placed above. I'll show you just now. This is now the whole procedure. So this is the pump, and this is where the temperature is maintained, and this is the reservoir from where the fluid goes as well as where we put in the your chemotherapeutic agent. Now happy can be performed using two techniques, either open or releasing technique or closed technique. So this is the open technique. We are not doing this. We are doing this closed technique. So you see the pipes are put in here. From above the ones is, uh, for the inflow and these are for the outflow and the temperature probes are attached. T1, T2 here and T3, T4 over here and after we have uh, placed these, then we close the abdomen completely, making it absolutely watertight. There's not much difference between the open and the closed technique except that of course it depends on what you are used to doing otherwise. Now what is the ideal drug? The ideal drug should be cell cycle non-specific water soluble having a synergistic effect with heat. Cisplatin is what is recommended by NCCN and that uh, is what we use. It is used in the dosage of 75 to 100 milligram. We calculate it as per the BSA. And you can see this is the device. This is the pump like I showed you and here we are injecting the material. I'll tell you how exactly the procedure is done. This, this is the pump. Sorry. Yeah, it's a little faint. So th this is the temperature that is maintained, 41 to 43 degrees centigrade. Flow rate is always there. Flow rate is important to prevent intestinal damage and to obtain a better temperature homogenization in the abdominal cavity. The suggested flow rate is 0.7 to 0.9 liters per minute. Duration is 30 minutes to 90 minutes, depending on the institutional protocol and other factors like the pharmacokinetics of the chemotherapeutic drugs, patient cell count, and renal function. Malignant disease is confined predominantly to the abdominal involving peritoneum without major systemic metastasis or parenchymal involvement. There is, there is a use of doing high only in such cases. Given the high rate of recurrence after surgery, that is 65%, practical sense in treating residual disease. So various studies have been done to enunciate the role of HIPEC. The most significant of that was the multicentric randomized control trial done by Van Brion in uh, 2018. And there they showed a benefit of PFS of 3.5 months and overall survival of 12 months for patients who were given HIPEC. ob hypec this is another trial where they showed that the median overall survival was 33.9 months for the interval CRS group and 45.7 months for the interval CRS plus HIPEC group. So also some people used HIPEC in the recurrent ovary setting and showed that both the PFS and OS improved on that. Now what did they do? Apart from doing CRS and HIPEC, Chan et al, they added Bevacizumab also and they showed that the OS again improved 
up to 70 months. So safety is another factor which has to be um, um, factored in. Surgical complications are mostly anastomotic leak, intra-abdominal hemorrhage and sepsis, toxicity specific to hypergar, hematological and renal. Transient bone marrow suppression can be there. Acute kidney injury is the most common toxicity in patients undergoing hyperkid cisplat. Postoperative care is the same as any other. And these are all the ongoing trials. This is the HIMOVA trial where they have two arms, one with normothermic uh, intraperitoneal chemotherapy and the other with uh, hyperthermic intraperitoneal chemotherapy. OB HIPEC 2, they are trying out, uh, again, HIPEC-ing, uh, upfront setting where they do a primary cytoreductive surgery. So this is one paper of ours, it was a multicentric um, paper, which was presented in ASCO, and uh, where from various centers the data was taken, and it showed that there's improved median OS as well as um, uh, DFS. So now this is a new thing that we have tried, this is HIPOC. So for patients who come with pleural disease, there, what we have done is that we have introduced this uh, same chemotherapeutic solution in the pleural cavity as well. And indication, I'll just show you a, a video of this. There's only one paper, there's just a case report. There are no RCTs to this, so I cannot tell you that. So we basically, we do a thoracoscopy, and uh, LX's, um, uh, this thing is used. And we introduce the, like it's done in bats, I'll show you. On one side where there was, plural, uh, where the pleura was, was, uh, uh, had small, small deposits only on the right side. And this is the other one. Where there were pleural deposits on both sides of the lungs. So we use this Alexis device to keep it open, open the uh, diaphragm so that the fluid, it went right from the abdominal cavity, through the thoracic cavity, and back. So the take home message is that uh, hyperthermic, that is hypic, popularly uh, is in which a heat, a heated solution of chemotherapy agent is uh, perfused throughout the peritoneal space. It is performed after achieving CC0. At present, ideal setting in COV is only, which is, uh, approved by NCCN. HIPEC must be performed immediately after surgery and cisplatin is the most commonly used chemotherapy. Temperature is 39 to 43 degrees and duration is 90 minutes, perioperative, postoperative care. Okay, I'll just quickly show you two videos. One is just some 20, 30 seconds and the other one is less than three minutes. Can you show these videos? Yeah, so this is the one with the high talk. So you see, we have opened the diaphragm We open a diaphragm on both sides. It's the heart in the center, and that's, that's the lung. Yeah. And you can see that's, that's all over on both sides. The pleura was clear now because this was done after we uh, had given chemotherapy to the patient. And uh, we kept the flow going for about 60, 60 minutes, not the full 90. We kept doing suction along with it so that there is adequate circulation. Of course, we put in an ICD after this. I'll show you the ICD. So this is just to show you how we put in the tubes. When we give HIPEC. So the tubes are just placed. 
This is from below, so this would be for the outlet, and the one for the inlet is from above, and it is, that is placed below. Okay, so now for a few practical points, I will just share with you how we actually do it. So what we do is we calculate the cis platinum which is to be used. Then, since it is an aqua solution, we divide it into four syringes. We give half the solution immediately after the uh, temperature is attained. So what you do is you put the peritoneal fluid in the reservoir and you circulate it into the abdomen and you wait till the temperature, required temperature is attained. Once the required temperature is attained, then we put in half the drug and then we wait for about 30 minutes. After 30 minutes, we put the third syringe. And after the another 30 minutes, we put the last syringe. So that means the whole of the drug is in the intra-abdominal cavity only for the last 30 minutes. So this is how Van Trial had also done it. So we are also doing it like this only. And after, after this, what we do is we open the abdomen, we remove the tubes, and we clean up the whole abdominal cavity with saline, and subsequently place a drain and close the patient. So if there are any other questions, I'm ready to take them. Mama, I have a question. Uh, it's a pleasure to be, I'm here by one, one of the chairpersons right here. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> so it's a pleasure to be chairing your session, uh, talk, ma'am. So um, uh, as per HIPEC, uh, how have the adverse effects been at uh, uh, Rajiv Gandhi uh, Institute? So, okay. So um, by and large, we have done fine. We had even published a paper and presented it in IGCS where we uh, showed about uh, how we had given hydric in 185 patients. So what we do is that uh, we hydrate the patients very well. And we have found that uh, we try to do hydric in some uh, cases of recurrent CA ovary. And that is why we had maximum problem because these patients had already received carboplatin. And even though carboplatin is less nephrotoxic than cisplat, but still it is some amount of toxicity is there. And when we did high for these patients, one of them had a complete kidney shutdown. But she recovered after a few dialysis. And for another one, she also had uh, some amount of kidney uh, dysfunction. Her creatinine rose to about two or three. But uh, what we did is we gave uh, bolus and flushed out the kidney for about three days. Morning, evening, we would give a bolus of uh, saline and uh, followed by lessix uh, uh, or something, and the patient recovered. And for patients who underwent bowel resection and in so they did fairly all right. But the bowel resection is not an issue. Not an issue. No, you do the bowel resection. Thank you. <laughs> and very nice videos. Uh, what about like when do you do bowel anastomosis? Before putting the uh, chemotherapy or uh, after completing the procedure? Of, uh, uh, Generally after. after. In, yeah. Initially for a few mm -hmm. cases we used to first uh, do the anastomosis and then then do hypec. Mm -hmm. But now like so many papers have come forward and they are saying that you can do it any which way. So by and large we just uh, leave it and do complete all these procedures subsequently. Okay. And like um, you have presented that paper. Uh, I would just not wanted to know like how, which, which type of patients you are selecting for uh, this HIPEC, like which clinical scenario, primary surgery or recurrent tumor, or uh, is it only in uh, intravert site reduction patients? So most of our patients are uh, patients of IDS, that is interval uh, debulking surgery. But we have, in fact, when we started doing HIPEC, we started doing on recurrent COV actually, even though it was just in a trial setting and uh, we really didn't have much evidence for it. But uh, now we are doing for most of our patients uh, who come to us uh, for interval debulking surgery, except of course, if they are, uh, you know, the PS is not very good and we think that we will not be able to resect the disease because sometimes, you know, when you open the patient, there are plaque-like disease everywhere. You can't really do justice. There's no point in doing high in such patients. Affordability is not an issue because we, uh, it's just cost them another 60, 80,000 or more. Primary, primarily, it is actually basically the optimal cytoreduction. Yeah. If absolutely. that is possible, then you can uh, put uh, intra 
expect from chemotherapy, it's going to give a good result after that. Yeah. Yeah. But as far as recurrent is concerned, actually for doing a second surgery itself is a controversial topic. Whether you should do one yeah. interval cycle reduction or not in a recurrent ovarian cancer. So I don't know whether HIPEC uh, is going to have some benefit in that scenario. So I I also don't know because there isn't any trial so far wherein uh, they are giving HIPEC for uh, recurrent COV. But some centers are doing it, and when we choose a patient for surgery for uh, recurrency ovary, definitely the patient has to fill into, uh, fit into all those desktop three uh, trial uh, criteria. Only then we would take up the patient for surgery. So at present, I think indication, basic indication is for interval site reduction. Absolutely, the approved indication standard of care guideline is only for interval debulking surgery. So are you doing IPEC for patients who have resectable parenchymal disease? So like liver metastasis which are resectable or a splenic med where you can easily get away with splenic med. So resectable parenchymal disease is a contraindication for IPEC. We are not doing it. Not even for splenic med, post splenic med? No. Because you see, once the patient starts having parenchymal uh, metastasis, you don't know where all there is parenchymal metastasis. And what are we achieving with HIPEC? We are only addressing peritoneal disease. So where patient has already got parenchymal disease, there is no, no point in uh, you know, doing it. And when we are doing uh, section, we are doing only of the macroscopic disease. We don't know what is the state of the microscopic disease. I mean, we have to follow some ethic, no? Yeah, that's true, madam. But even even cytoreduction, cytoreduction surgery. Otherwise, we are doing macroscopic disease only. Yeah, that's so, true. The whole concept of ovarian uh, uh, cancer surgery is debulking the disease. The absolutely, tumor. absolutely. You know, yeah, debulking the volume. But the concept of uh, HIPEC is not that. Concept of HIPEC is to address the surface tumor cells. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So for uh, uh, even though it is, yes, yes. We know surface. Many, uh, we know surface tumor. How much is left? But for parenchymal, we don't know. Yeah, so true, I don't know madam. In, in case of liver, that's different. But if it uh, it is a deposit in the spleen, I think we can still consider doing a hyper even that. We are not doing it because for for deposit in spleen, we must be next me. You are achieving yeah. a complete yeah. cytoreduction. Yeah, maybe, but but we are not doing it. So, I am just telling you what we are not doing. We are not doing it. If you do a splenectomy, we do not do a uh, So I am just asking because we have done just a few cases, eight, and one of them was when we did a splenectomy for the patient. So, I was it's just... Your choice, your patient. <laughs> I cannot say anything for that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And anybody from the audience? Ma'am, is cisplatin alone the drug of choice or have we tried dual drug in high tech as well? So, um, cisplatinum is actually the standard of care, but where the patients come to us with a recurrent disease or where, you know, some patients of mucinous uh, CA, where they have come to us with recurrent disease, we have tried doxydobusin and iphosphobicin also. Ma'am, apart from the part of the patient, we operated, uh, did you uh, use any uh, protective agent like chemical or steroids? No, we don't. Yeah, perhaps we should be using, we have considered it, but uh, uh, you know, so far we haven't used any kidney protective agent. We have been lucky so far, like I told you, we had a problem only with two patients, and both those patients were uh, recurrent uh, so cost in our hospital is not much, it's just an additional 60-80,000. Yeah, apart from the cost that the uh, patient has to incur for doing surgery as such. Hello. Great talk on uh, HIPAC. So my question is, in the present present era of PARP inhibitors and use of bevacizumab, where do you place HIPAC? We are surgeons. HIPAC will always be on the top. So as a medical oncologist, I will always say PARP or uh, 
Vivasism uh, is better. Compared See, for power point inhibitors, you also have to factor in the cost. Power point inhibitors are definitely fantastic. There's no doubt about that. Uh, overall survival does matter. No, yes, it does matter. But they, we don't have any such studies. Like I told you, that there's only one study wherein they have added bevacizumab, not PARP inhibitors. And they have found that if you do CRS plus IPEC plus bevacizumab, the OS is much better. But then it's just a small study. No, no, we are not giving interoperatively. We are just giving it as a yes, yes. I never said interoperatively. Ma'am, uh, good evening, ma'am. Here, ma'am, and the speaker. Yeah, yeah. Uh, nice talk on uh, cyberdetective surgery as well on the hypec. My question is: the, Does there any benefit of a survival benefit of adding uh, the repeated cyto reduction in the patients? Does there any benefit of I mean repeated cyto reduction in the patients? Any survival benefit of the repeated cyto reduction? So if you look at the curve for the, uh, uh, as to how the ovarian cancer behaves, this is how it does. It keeps coming back sooner and sooner and you have to address it as best as you can, whether you're giving chemotherapy or you're doing cytoreductive surgery. As you know, Dr. Veena also al already uh, said so, there are very, very few patients who actually qualify for secondary cytoreductive surgery, but who do qualify, definitely they would like to do it. The one more question is there that uh, what should be the ideal protocol of uh, in stage 3 ovarian cancers about the neurogen chemotherapy or the hypec or with the cytoreductive surgery? What should be the protocol? So that's a very, very difficult question because nobody in the world so far has an answer to that. Several studies have shown that both the DFS and OS is the same. Whether you give NACT and then do IDS and then subsequently adjuvant therapy or you do an upfront surgery followed by six cycles of chemotherapy. So by and large, it is the same. What matters is the surgical expertise. The whole story is about surgical expertise. Wherever you can do your surgery best, howsoever, whether you can do it after you have given the patient uh, three cycles of chemotherapy, or you can do it upfront, the whole idea is to be able to completely cytoreduce the disease. Is it a good idea to give neurogen chemotherapy followed by the cytoreductive surgery that is easy to resect and followed by the intravitreal? No, I'm sorry, I need to disagree with you because there are many patients where you do uh, NACT and subsequent resection uh, is quite impossible. There is so much of desmoplastic reaction, you cannot remove the nodes, you cannot remove so much of the disease. Not only that, you don't only really know where is the disease. So, so many areas where there is actually disease, they just don't get addressed. Sorry to, but uh, if I, if uh, chairpersons permit, so can we, because would be an endless, I suppose. One well, last question to Rupinder. You had so much experience in HIPEC. The patients where you have done HIPEC as a primary setting, do you ever have a chance to reoperate those patients for any reason, like obstruction or anything of that, or a recurrence? Do you have any experience when we reopen these patients? How is their abdominal cavity? So we have done re-HIPEC for five patients till now, and um, they are doing well. As well as, yes, same, same thing, say absolutely same criteria apply for a secondary cytoreductive surgery and we have done hepatic and we've repeated the hepatic, but only five patients. One point question. If someone you have shown this video of uh, someone who has given a chemotherapy in the so in that case, so you operate, uh, you first enter the virus or the problem? I'm sorry, I didn't get the question. In case of which you have given a chemotherapy in Torres along with the Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but in that case, you go through the Torres or you go through the Torres? No, abdomen. Abdomen. You go through the abdomen and we excise the diaphragm and. Uh, in abdomen, you can you can use the Torres. Absolutely. The Torres is the most important thing to see the Torres. We are not operating on the Torres. These are mostly patients who have small uh, pleural nodules and who had pleural effusion to start with. Now there is no pleural effusion, though in one patient there was some pleural nodules which we removed. That's easily done, that's not easy. That's not very difficult. What's your dose of cisplatin in those cases? Oh, All cases, dose of cisplatin is 100 milligrams per meter square. Including thorax? Including thorax. Thank you so much, ma'am. It was indeed an informative session. Uh, if we do not have any further questions, we'll move on to the next session, please. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much, ma'am, for a wonderful session. I would now request our uh, chairperson to please felicitate our speaker. I would now request Dr. Sandhya Sudmam, Senior Consultant, Radiation Colleges, to felicitate our chairpersons, please. Dr. Veena Jain. Shireen Garg. Dr. Ritesh Pruthi. Dr. Romi Kant Grover. Please. Thank you all once again. Going forward with our discussion on ovarian cancer, maintenance therapy for ovarian cancer is medication that's given to prevent can ovarian cancer from coming back after initial treatment with chemotherapy. The goal is to increase the amount of time between the initial treatment and the recurrence. Taking the inputs from the experts in this field, our next topic for the day is maintenance therapy in platinum-sensitive ovarian cancer, role of bevacizumab and PARP inhibitors. For this, I would request of chairpersons to please uh, come on the stage, Dr. Kunal Jain, Assistant Professor, Medical Oncology, DMCH Cancer Center. Dr. Vijay Bansal, Surgical Oncologist, IV Hospital, Mohali. Dr. Yagesh Kaba, Surgical Oncologist, Oswal Hospital, Ludhiana. Dr. Sahil, Assistant Professor, Surgical Oncology, Tata Hospital, Sangroor. Request you all to please come on the stage. request our chairpersons to please introduce our speaker, Dr. Jatin Sari. So good evening, everyone. So after uh, extensive discussion after the last uh, session, we switch gears and move to medical oncology and the role of uh, systemic therapy in uh, ovarian cancer. And uh, for the talk on maintenance therapy, um, it is my privilege to invite uh, uh, my dear uh, friend and uh, senior colleague, Dr. Jatin Sareen, who is Director of Medical Oncology at IVY Hospital, Mohali, and uh, Chandigarh Cancer and Diagnostic Center. Dr. Jatin, please. Good evening. I hope I'm audible. I'll thank you, Kunal, uh, for giving me this uh, small topic of uh, discussing the maintenance uh, of, uh, in ovarian cancer. So in ovarian cancer, I consider two holy grails. Of, there are two holy grails of treatment. One is platinum sensitivity, and other is to increase the platinum free interval. So. People have used maintenance therapy to somehow increase the platinum free interval. And uh, these will be my contents. What is the local scenario? What are the unmet needs? 
in ovarian cancer, role of vivacism and maintenance before the advent of PAPS, DNA repair, PAP inhibition and synthetic lethality, and clinical evidence of PAP inhibitors as maintenance in newly diagnosed and then in platinum sensitive relapsed ovarian cancer. So this is the scenario. Worldwide, eighth most common. India, third most common cancer among females. Incidence in India is 6.3 to 7.3 per lakh population. And uh, out of the 45,701 females affected, there is a mortality of 32,077. So, uh, too much of, uh, uh, you can say, morbid cancer. And 14% of overall ovarian cancer patient and as high as 22% in patients with high-grade epithelial ovarian tumor have a germline BRCA1 or 2 mutations. So this is an important line I, I would like to everyone of you to keep in mind. So why there is an unmet need? Uh, because with first line um, on newly diagnosed ovarian cancer, the platinum combo gave us a median uh, PFS of around say 10 months. With the advent of Bivasi uh, in various trials as we saw, led it to at the max 18 months. And uh, this is the, this was a scenario because of this 70% of females relapse within three years of first line treatment and only 38% go on to survive for five years. This is the usual biology in platinum sensitive, I would say, uh, ovarian cancer. Platinum resistant is still quite miserable. And uh, patients receive multiple lines of IV chemotherapy with ever decreasing periods of uh, remission in between the regimes, as you can see. And platinum free interval, as I said, is an important predictor of future response to platinum therapy. Yeah, in the in the clinics also you feel really comfortable if the patient has uh, DFS or PFS of more than one year uh, or more than six months to one year. There are a few lucky females who have a PFI of uh, more than three years, but they are very few. So whenever the PFI is more, you get longer OS uh, because the subsequent therapy can be delivered really well and you have a better response to the subsequent therapy, you have better uh, 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 way, and even as you see, as uh, Madam was discussing about secondary cytal reduction, you can offer them secondary cytal reduction also. Now, about the Bivasi uh, uh, map, these are the consensus statements uh, made by uh, a team of various top Indian experts in advanced ovarian cancer. I'm not dealing with all the bevacizumab trials uh, uh, at this juncture because it would unnecessarily prolong this lecture. So I would just tell you the consensus, consensus statement and these are based on various trials in the first line and platinum sensitive relapse ovarian cancer. And uh, bevacizumab has a different role now but uh, in the Indian context, still, vivacizumab is an important molecule because of exorbitant cost of PARP inhibitors and hardly 10% of our Indian population, even with the advent of Indian generic, able to take it. So the first line uh, it, uh, for vivacizumab, it is an option for first line treatment in combination of carbofacly for newly diagnosed stage 3 and 4 epithelial ovarian cancer. Uh, ovarian fallopian tube primary peritoneal. It improves OS in patient with high risk disease. High risk is when it is suboptimally debulked stage three or uh, stage four disease. The recommended dose of BYC mostly in Indian patients, people uh, uh, were using 7.5 mg per kg every three weeks uh, with chemo, followed by maintenance for uh, 12 additional cycles. So this was in the Indian scenario uh, most of the time. The evidence is of moderate quality, but this was the general practice. 
for relapse ovarian cancer, platinum sensitive, yeah. carbo, gem, and BRC can be recommended for all who have not previously received BRC, and the evidence is quite high quality. And BRC may be continued as maintenance therapy if used previously as part of a combination chemotherapy in patients achieving partial or complete response for platinum sensitive disease. So the, the, this was what we are actually practicing and uh, uh, we are uh, mostly agreeing uh, on these guidelines. There have been a lot of controversies about the Bevacis map data. Uh, so anyways, now what is PAR? So PAS, uh, uh, why the question of PAR came into being? Uh, in the tumor cell, there is a loss of DNA damage repair pathways like homologous recombinant repair pathways. See, our DNA uh, damage is a con continuous process in each and every normal cell uh, during or without even division process. So uh, there are a lot of mechanisms by which uh, you know, uh, our cell tries to re uh, repair this DNA damage. The, the difference is uh, between a normal cell and a um, uh, tumor cell is that normal cells can compensate for the loss of individual DNA damage repair pathway, whereas cancer cells with uh, especially homologous recombinant repair enzyme deficiencies uh, revert to error-prone pathways, non-homologous and joining pathway or uh, various other uh, ways uh, uh, and which leads to this leaves cells vulnerable to inhibition of remaining pathways and cell death by a process of synthetic lethality. HRR deficiency is common across multiple tumor types and in a study of more than 50,000 tumors, it was observed in uh, around 17% of tumors across 21 cancer lineages. In ovarian cancer, non BRCA, HRR mutation occurred in around 7% of patients. In study 19, which was the first study of PARP inhibitor in platinum sensitive relapse of ovarian cancer, 10% of patients who were BRCA wild type uh, had HRR mutation. So there is a, therefore, a large population of patients across multiple tumors with a spectrum of genomic instability who may benefit from PARP inhibitor therapy. Now, how the PARPs act? PARP enzyme is required to repair a single strand DNA break. PARP actually attaches to this particular enzyme uh, uh, which is required for a single uh, repair of single strand break and uh, uh, PARP inhibitor actually attached to that PARP. Now, suppose a single strand break is not repaired, it progresses to double strand breaks and homologous recombination, which is the most authentic way of repairing DNA in our body, uh, repairs these double strand breaks. If there is a homologous recombination enzyme deficiency, the number of double strand breaks increase and that lead to uh, uh, cell death. So this is how PARC functions. Now, in the newly diagnosed ovarian cancer, uh, and uh, also platinum sensitive. These are the various trials. Initially, the PARP, uh, various PARPs, uh, the three most common uh, what we are aware of in ovary is Olaparib and Rukaparib and Niraparib. So Olaparib, Niraparib were the first to be studied in uh, relapsed ovarian cancer maintenance. And uh, then came uh, Olaparib in first line, uh, the landmark trial. And then uh, simultaneously, Rukaparib was studied in recurrent platinum sensitive ovarian cancer. Niraparib was studied in uh, HRD, homologous recombinant deficiency positive relapse ovarian cancer in 2019. And uh, first line maintenance, uh, Niraparib uh, was approved in 2020. And with bevacizumab combination, since bevacizumab uh, was used in uh, stage three and four ovarian cancer in most of the places. So if uh, patients on uh, bevacizumab, this olaparib was added and uh, they saw some uh, wonderful results. So olaparib plus bevacizumab combination was approved. That is Paula one trial. 
these are the various uh, US FDA approved BAP inhibitors in uh, ovarian cancer. Just see the first two columns only. First line ovarian cancer and relapsed ovarian cancer. I think Rukaparib uh, thing is wrong in this because now with the advent of Athena Mono trial, Rukaparib is also approved in first line. Now what is the clinical evidence of PAP inhibitors as maintenance therapy for newly diagnosed advanced ovarian cancer? Now these are the various trials. Pola 1 trial, uh, combination of PARP and BEV, Prima trial, Niraparib, Solo 1, uh, uh, specifically in germline and somatic BRCA mutation, uh, that was of Olaparib. And uh, the, la uh, the lower two trials are of Bevacizumab trials, GOG218 and IPON7. So I think uh, we just uh, need to see them in the context of the PFS shown by PAP maintenance versus Bevacizumab. So, uh, Olaparib uh, maintenance has been investigated in newly diagnosed advanced ovarian cancer in two phase three trial. One was the SOLO1 trial and the other one was POLA1 trial uh, in combination with RACA. So what was SOLO1 trial? It was the first phase three trial which investigated Olaparib in first line. Uh, it included all newly diagnosed uh, stage 3, 4 high grade serous so or endometrioid, ovarian, primary peritoneal, or fallopian tube cancer with germline or somatic BRCA mutation, uh, good performance status, and uh, cytoreductive surgery in clinical complete response or partial response after platinum based therapy. So, Olaparib was given, uh, there was 2 is to 1 randomization in response to, uh, and stratification was uh, by uh, response to platinum based therapy. So Olaparib was, uh, was given in the dosage of 300 milligrams twice a day and there was, uh, it was given for two years uh, if there was no progression of disease. And uh, patient uh, with partial response at two years uh, according to the Mm, uh, patient benefit and uh, uh, the investigators uh, 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 thought process they even uh, these PARP inhibitors were continued. The primary endpoint was uh, uh, investigator assessed PFS, secondary endpoints were PFS uh, by independent review and PFS 2 overall survival time to randomization to first uh, subsequent therapy and also the second subsequent therapy and also uh, hazard uh, this uh, uh, quality of life score. So the, as far as cytoreductive surgery was concerned, upfront surgery with residual macroscopic disease, without residual macroscopic disease and uh, uh, Interval cytoreductive surgery also with residual and without residual macroscopy. The uh, number of patients were equal in both the arms. There were there were patients without surgery also. So after five years follow up, the PFS benefit uh, was derived and was substantial, and it was beyond the end of treatment. You can see the hazard ratio. Uh, of 0.33. The median PFS was 56 month as compared to 13.8 month in the placebo arm. And uh, subsequently I'll show you the data cutoff rate at 7 years. Uh, the uh, This kind of hazard ratio is maintained. And 60% uh, of patients on Olaparib remain progression free at 3 years versus only 27% on placebo and nearly half of patients on placebo had progressed within 12 months. So this was the effect of uh, Olaparib maintenance. All subsets of patients, whether there was a complete or partial response to previous chemotherapy, whether baseline CA125 was raised beyond or lower uh, uh, upper limit of normal, whether it was BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation or both, age more than or less than 65 years, stage 3 or 4. So all subsets, uh, you can see the hazard ratio varying from 0.30 uh, to maximum 0.45. Isn't it too early for the bell?
This is the first call. You still have five minutes. These are the other parameters. Uh, I have to really fast now. So, median time to first subsequent therapy or death, 0 0.30 hazard ratio. Median PFS to 0 0.50. Median time to second subsequent therapy or death, 0.45. Median OS, 0.95. So, OS is not mature and it is not statistically significant as yet. The most common adverse effect. Uh, uh, or gastrointestinal dis disturbances, anemia and fatigue. The important adverse effect of all PARP inhibitor as a class is uh, development of MDS or AML. Uh, in this particular trial, it was 3% and new primary malignancy, uh, sorry, it's 1.2%, new primary malignancy around 2% uh, and pneumonitis, uh, pneumonitis an underrated uh, side effect, but an important side effect of PARP inhibitors. So uh, this is at seven years data cutoff. 67% uh, of Olaparib patients are alive at seven years versus 46.5% of placebo. So indicating maybe and we may have a survival uh, meaningful OS benefit. Time to first subsequent therapy hazard ratio good enough, 0.37. Time to second sub uh, subsequent therapy hazard ratio 0.50. Now, what about non BRCA mutated patient? And this was uh, specifically taken uh, or studied in Paul Owen trial. In this, uh, uh, patients were randomized uh, between uh, Olaparib <coughs> plus bevacizumab and placebo plus bevacizumab. And the uh, uh, Eligibility criteria were the same, but uh, the patient and the patient should have received at least more than equal to three cycles of bevacizumab along with the primary chemotherapy. The PFS was the first primary uh, was the endpoint, uh, primary endpoint. Secondary endpoints was nearly similar. The arms were uh, nearly similar, and uh, let's come to the uh, results. So median PFS with Olaparib plus bevacizumab in intent to treat population was 22.1 month versus 16.6 months in bevacizumab alone arm, which is uh, expected. Uh, and uh, the hazard ratio was 0.59. And this was, mind you, in intent to treat population. All subgroup, whether BRCA mutated, HRD positive, HRD wild type, everyone was included. And if you see the subset analysis, uh, if there was a patient was tumor uh, uh, BRCA or somatic BRCA mutated, then the difference in median PFS was around 15.5 months and the hazard ratio was 0.31. If they were HRT positive, the median PFS difference was around 19.5 months and hazard ratio was 0.33. In HRT negative or unknown, the hazard ratio was not much difference. So, uh, uh, it is an effective combination and uh, uh, in subsequent lines of therapy, uh, people are, are trying PARP inhibition along with bevacizumab as the sole chemotherapy free regimen also. We will come to that trial. All subsets uh, improved. So, and uh, adverse effect profile of Olaparib was uh, similar in Paula 1 was consistent with the previous trial. Uh, so Olaparib plus BEV provided a clinically meaningful improvement in OS uh, in HRD positive patient has that ratio uh, of uh, 0.62 in 5 year OS rate of 65.5 months uh, versus 48.4. And uh, median PFS was almost four years in Olaparib plus BEVAM for HRD positive patients. These are the various subgroups, and all you can see is in HRD negative, there was not much of a difference, but still uh, there was a trend towards better OS. Then there was this primer trial, Niraparib, not yet available in India. Uh, 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 but maintenance niraparib was used in uh, again uh, it was used in all comers 
and uh, uh, the dosage used was 300 milligram um, uh, once a day uh, and the drug was given for 36 months as against 24 months. In this trial, actually HRD was studied by My Choice Companion Diagnostics and uh, uh, it was uh, given as a GIS or Genomic Instability Score uh, in which loss of heterozygosity, telomeric allelic imbalance and large scale transition was uh, were taken together and a phenotypically genomic instable tumor was given HRD positive when it was, uh, the, the score was more than equal to 42. So uh, the BFS in HRD positive patient was uh, 21.9 months versus 10.4 months. Again, a positive trial, and there was 57% reduction in risk of relapse or death with mirapiravir placebo. Safety analysis: thrombocytopenia was a, uh, a significant uh, side effect in mirapiravir, and that's why. Uh, uh, the dosage was subsequently, it was advised that less than 70 uh, kg and uh, uh, less than 1.5 uh, lakh platelets should be given 200 milligram dosage uh, versus 300 milligram. And uh, uh, despite all these dose interruptions and treatment discontinuations, there was uh, PFS benefit. For BRCA mutations, as you can see, the hazard ratio was 0.39, nearly similar to the Olaparib uh, group. And for BRCA2, it was uh, 0.35. So efficacy was nearly similar in BRCA1, BRCA2. In HRD BRCA mutations, hazard ratio was 0.4. In HRD BRCA wild type, it was 0.5. And uh, if in HRP, that is uh, homologous recombinant proficient patient, the hazard ratio is 0.68. So that was an all-comer thing. You can use niraparib maintenance in uh, all comers without even testing for DRACA. Then recently this trial was presented, uh, Athena Mono. It was maintenance rucaparib versus placebo in first line maintenance, uh, first line platinum based CT in advanced ovarian cancer. There were actually four arms in this trial, and that uh, because uh, uh, there was a, uh, it was studied with nivolumab in combination with rucaparib. So the analysis, the current analysis was with mono. Mono means only rucaparib compared with placebo and uh, uh, nivolumab arm uh, analysis is not yet available. So uh, uh, the primary endpoint was again PFS, secondary endpoint again OS and all. So the hazard ratio was 0.47. Rucaparib maintenance significantly prolonged investigator assess PFS versus placebo in HRD population. So the another PAP inhibitor, it was approved in first line. In intent to treat population, it, the median PFS was 20.2. So again, all comers uh, without even uh, testing, uh, you can give uh, Rucaparib. But how much it will have an uh, impact on OS is still debatable. So these are the various populations, uh, HRD positive, HRD negative, and DACA uh, wild type. And the hazard ratios are all really good, but uh, only for PFS. What about platinum sensitive uh, relapse ovarian cancer? These were the trial. And uh, uh, study 19 was the first trial for Olaparib, and then came solo two, and now even solo three has come. Uh, then a NOVA trial was there for Niraparib. Aerial three trial was is there for Rucaparib. And simultaneously there are second line Bevacizumab maintenance trial in Aurelia, GOG 213, and Oceans. We won't be going into those details. So, just two minutes. Uh, so these were the uh, results. Uh, in recurrent ovarian cancer after response to platinum 
the you can see the PFS had a hazard ratios all favorable. Uh, even in aerial three intent to treat population, 0.36. In NOVA non germline BRCA mutation, 0.53. In uh, Olaparib, uh, germline BRCA mutated solo to 0 0.30. So uh, median PFS uh, benefit was always there in second line, and that's why they were studied in first line. Study 19, I won't go into the detail. Solo 2, uh, again, an important trial for Olapare. Mm, uh, I'll just rush through there. Now this was the concept I was talking about, Evan over 2. Evan over 2 is a trial in which in subsequent line a chemo-free uh, uh, therapy was tried in the form of niraparib uh, with addition of bevacizumab in platinum sensitive patients and uh, the median PFS obtained uh, was around 11.9 months so in uh, niraparib plus bevacizumab arm. So this was actually intention A, A this was intention, the first graph is of intention to treat and this was HRD positive and uh, these uh, these were uh, HRD negative and chemo pre interval of 6 months versus 12 months so all these graphs showed there was a benefit so this is just a proof of uh, a concept uh, but there are no guidelines as yet so then some people said okay, if we use PARP inhibitor in the first line, can we re-challenge the patient with the PARP inhibitor maintenance subsequently? So there was an Oreo trial. Uh, I like the name of this trial, Oreo Biscuit, Oreo trial. And the first phase three randomized controls study to evaluate the effect of PARP maintenance after PARP, previous PARP exposure. This was a very, very small study, but uh, yes, there was an indication uh, that if there was a complete response to platinum-based therapy, there was a benefit in adding PARP inhibitor, especially the Olapari was uh, studied and it can be used, but again, there are no guidelines. Finally, I just want to uh, give you uh, the what actually Cochrane uh, sees looking at all these various trials happening and you can find the updated ESCO recommendations also um, uh, easily. So Cochrane says that PARP inhibitor maintenance treatment after chemotherapy may improve PFS in women with new, newly diagnosed and recurrent platinum sensitive relapsed ovarian cancer. There may be little to no effect on OS, although the OS data are immature. And uh, overall, this is likely at the expense of increase in severe adverse events. The data on quality of life outcomes, this is what Cochrane said in most of the trial, are relatively sparse. And more research is needed to determine whether PARP inhibitor have a role to play in platinum resistant disease, which is actually a bad, very bad subset of ovarian cancer. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jatin. Uh, house is now open for just a quick, uh, maybe one or maximum two questions. Yes, yes, you are audible. If the patient is according, you must give. Uh, still, uh, I would say this is what the review says. You may give. There is a significant. See, in ovary, advanced ovary, it's 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 uh, basically. Uh, uh, to maintain again as I said platinum free interval so as long as we can maintain that platinum free interval we, we hope that there would be an OS advantage in future uh, but these are the current guidelines that they, they say uh, that 
So if a patient is affording, and especially if they are, uh, uh, if you ask me personally, if she is germline BRCA mutant, I would definitely tell her to take it. Yeah. Exactly. So, uh, if someone asks you, Mengi both are the only one of the nine. That's my simple uh, answer. Because, uh, you know, there are so many of these studies and things are not yet clear. It is still a learning curve, I would say, uh, with uh, so much of EFS improvement. But at the end of the day, uh, we are uh, in the clinics, we are treating patients with a variety of uh, things uh, in uh, ovarian cancers, the subsequent lines of chemotherapy, and that kind of survivals, uh, even uh, each one of us would have achieved in few of the patients. So uh, this was just uh, utilizing the biology uh, of PARC. In future, maybe there are going to be few combinations uh, of PARC uh, with other agents, which may give uh, maybe a meaningful uh, survival benefit, maybe. So I'm, I'm not sure, I, I, I would say only those patients who really want that Dr. Sahib koi goli de do, paise di koi chinta nahi hai, I can take it. Nothing, Divasi, Divasi was the thing, na? Divasizumab was given, uh, it increased PFS, uh, the, but only again, Vivasi also, not in stage two or, uh, uh, you know, only suboptimally debulked stage three and stage four, Vivasi led to increase in PFS. Otherwise, uh, the same question arose for Vivasi also. Now, again, we are on the same platform with PARC. Only thing is, this time the PFSs are longer. Sir, actually this query, it came more to us after that wonderful uh, medical oncology miracle in colorectal when 12 patients were treated and they got fully cured. So people are really scared of surgery and then we have to tell them about the need for re-surgery. But as a surgical oncologist, it's very difficult for us to, adver uh, to assess the adverse effects as well. Yeah. Okay. Because these tablets, mm. they, they, they are really having a lot of adverse effects as well. Absolutely, and uh, I don't know, I haven't used all of the combination. So I think the role know. of surgery is never in question, so I think you are quite safe. So there is no, no question about that uh, surgery is not needed. Yeah, not the question is only that after surgery, how do we, how do we? prevent the uh, recurrence or how do we delay uh, the subsequent progression? And I think patients make life much easier for you because they will make the choice. They will tell you that they are unable to afford. So it is not. A, it is a. It is academic uh, for discussion. It is good to know, but it is not a blanket statement that we can apply to our all patients in our OPD, especially in our setting. I think it is a very pertinent question. So only selected patients who are affording definitely they will ask that is there anything else I can do yes, yes, to yes. Uh, increase my chances of being disease free. And, and to tell you the truth, these Cochrane reviews also keep on getting updated. Definitely. So when, uh, and there has been a withdrawal of uh, few PAP inhibitors uh, in uh, subsequent lines of treatment. Suppose patient has not taken a PAP inhibitor in first line. Uh, in NOVA, when uh, there was a mature survival analysis done, it was uh, actually a deterrent. I mean, it was uh, uh, the chemotherapy arm or placebo arm had a better overall survival, though PFS was uh, uh, more uh, on this study. So again, you should be really careful. So these reviews, uh, these meta-analysis will keep on coming up, thankfully. And you will see that uh, whatever approvals are there at present, they will
keep on getting reviewed and updated. Uh, uh, and uh, we, uh, we actually, st I'm, I'm saying it's just a learning curve. It is for a patient who says that I can afford it and I want to take it. I want to give my patient the best chance. Uh, if you have something. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. Thank, thank you, Dr. Jatin. We can um, ask him questions during the tea break. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for the session. I would request our chairperson to please felicitate our speaker. Thank you all. I would request Dr. Jenny, Senior Radiation Oncologist, CMC, Ludhiana, and Dr. Sumit Jain, Assistant, Associate Professor, Surgical Oncology, DMCH Cancer Center, to please felicitate our chairpersons. Dr. Kunal Jain, Dr. Vijay Bansal, Dr. Yogesh Kaba, Dr. Yogesh Kaba. Dr. Sahil. Thank you all. Dr. Jenny, please, you are required on the stage. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Jenny and Dr. Sumit. So after such brainstorming sessions, I think we need a break of uh, 30 minutes. So we uh, all uh, are all invited for tea break, and then we resume our sessions. I think we would like to come back up. 20 minutes, sorry. It has been cut down to 20 minutes because of we are running short of time. Dr. Brahar says 5.30 we have to be back, so please. DMCH, Dr. Jaspinder, Radiation Oncologist, CCA, Dr. Praveen Yadav, Director, Surgical Oncology, Artemis Gurgaon, Dr. Vinay Samuel, Director, Surgical Oncology, CK Birla, Gurgaon, Dr. Anshuma Bansal, Radiation Oncologist, Government Medical College. Patiala, please can I have all of you on the stage? <laughs> I request the chairpersons to please uh, introduce our speaker, Dr. Kiran Mahindra, please. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I would like to invite Dr. Kiran Mahindra. She is an assistant professor in the Department of Anesthesia Cancer Center, EMC. She is DM in Onco Anesthesia and Palliative Medicine from AIMS New Delhi. Welcome. So, good evening, everyone. Thank you, sir, for your kind words. And thank you for the Department of Surgical Oncology for giving me this opportunity. So, I'll be talking about the anesthetic considerations for cytoreductive surgery and hyperthermic intraperitoneal chemotherapy. So, 
basically these procedures are done for peritoneal surface malignancies which can be primarily involving the peritoneum or peritoneal carcinomatosis caused by GI or uh, gynecological malignancies where the cytoreduction part is done to cover the macroscopic disease and the microscopic disease is handled by using giving hyperthermic installation of chemotherapy into the peritoneal cavity at the temperatures of around 41 to 43 degrees Celsius using special equipment for the perfusion. And both of these when combined lead to improved outcomes in these patients. So why are there specific concerns for an anesthetist for these procedures? And how are these procedures different from any other major abdominal surgeries? So basically these are prolonged surgeries with extensive resections and increased risk of fluid shifts and blood loss, which increase the risk of post-operative multi-system derangement. So that is why these case cases are special for anesthetists. So the specific concerns for these patients will be to improve the post-operative outcome, the first and foremost step will be appropriate patient selection, where the surgeon as well as anesthetist should act as a team and decide whether the patient is suitable to undergo this procedure. Now the pre-operative assessment will include a thorough history and examination of the patient and we'll just stratify the patient for the surgery and we'll decide the perioperative care of the patient and we'll give a multimodal prehabilitation program to the patient which will help improve the functional capacity of the patient so that the patient is able to handle the stress better in the perioperative period. Now all the cons major concerns are because of installation of hyperthermic chem chemotherapy in these patients which lead to a hypermetabolic state, hyperdynamic circulation which leads to various changes and can affect all the organ systems. And post-operatively, these patients will usually require care in the critical care unit to assess the various organ dysfunctions if happening in the post-operative period and their appropriate management. Now, enhanced recovery pathways, if used in the high tech procedures, can decrease the length of hospital stay of the patients and also lead to improvement in the cost factor. So coming to the selection criteria. So from an anesthesiologist's point of view, I need a patient who is medically optimized for all the comorbidities and is having no active cardiac condition and should have a good functional capacity to handle the stress of the high tech. From a surgeon point of view, they should be absent from any extra abdominal disease, extensive hepatic meds and significant retroperitoneal disease and the disease should be amenable to complete or near complete cytoreduction that, that is a CC, zero or one score should be achieved for high tech. Now, there is an index, uh, ma'am has already discussed, Dr. Gupinder, the peritoneal carcinomatosis index. So why is this index important for an anesthetist? So it has been seen that if a patient has higher PCI scores, there will be increased risk of blood loss, increased risk of, uh, increased need of uh, fluid, uh, fluid and blood transfusions, and there will be increased uh, chances of post need of post mechanical ventilation. So that is why PCI scores are important for, from an anesthetist point of view. Now, the, uh, pre uh, the risk assessment preoperatively should be done using the American Society of Anesthesiology grading and the ECO performance score is used to know the functional capacity of the patient. Now, at this point in the preoperative period, the most important part is the prehabilitation. That is, we give multimodal interventions to the patient to improve the functional capacity preoperatively, which will include the assessment of the nutrition needs of the patient using special preoperative nutrition scores, and uh, uh, then use of incentives, pyrometry, and deep breathing exercises to improve uh, the pulmonary function and decrease the risk of post of pulmonary complications, as well as medical optimization of all the comorbidities. Uh, the, Testing which is done preoperatively will depend on the risk of postoperative dysfunctions we expect in a patient post CRS hypic. So the pulmonary function assessment should be done because the patient usually have a situs which can lead to basal atelectasis and increase the risk of perioperative hypoxia for these patients. Therefore, the pulmonary function is assessed using chest X-ray, ABG, pulmonary function test, and cardiopulmonary exercise testing can be done preoperatively if it is feasible and the equipment is available with the hospital. So basically, CPET is a, a, a testing which is done, which assesses the objectively assesses the functional capacity of the patient, and which gives the value of the meds of the patient, and will also help to stratify the patient preoperatively. Now, the goal goal of cardiovascular assessment is to know if the patient is having any pre-existing cardiac condition, as well as to know the reserve the patient is having post-operatively to compensate for the 
metabolic changes which will occur during the high rate. So a baseline coagulation assessment is important to know any baseline coagulation abnormality because of hyperthermia there will be increases for coagulation abnormalities post operatively and it is important for us to, uh, to detect any coagulation abnormality pre operatively because we have to go for central uraxial blocks for post operative analgesia. And the, uh, because of increases for API in these patients because of installation of chemotherapy, especially cisplatin, uh, the preoperative uh, KFTs should be done. And the plan of perioperative pain management should be discussed with the patient preoperatively itself. All the options of pain management, including epidural, combined spinal epidural, as well as use of intravenous drugs, should be given to the patient. Now, apart from all this assessment, the preoperative counseling for the quality of life is must. Now, the pathophysiological changes during HIPEC occur because during the CRS phase, you can see there is a gradual decline in the temperature of the patient as CRS progresses, and this is common in all the major abdominal surgeries. But as the HIPEC period started, starts, there will be a gradual increase of the temperature till 60 minutes of HIPEC. Uh, like if you are going for a 60 minutes protocol for HIPEC, there will be a gradual increase of the temperature, and then this will calm down gradually in the next 60 minutes. So this difference of maximum and the minimum temperature is known as delta T, that is the delta temperature. And more is the delta temperature, more will be, more will be the risk of post-operative complications. So here is the role of anesthesiologist for thermoregulation in these patients. Now this temperature fluctuations affect all the organ systems. Now the hyperthermia phase will lead to hyperdynamic circulation and will the patient will have increased heart rate, CVP, cardiac index. The hyperthermia also will lead to peripheral vasodilatation, which will decrease the SVR and the mean arterial pressures. And increase intra-abdominal pressure, especially if we are going for a closed HIPEC, can lead to decreased venous return. In the respiratory system, there will be increase of airway pressures and decrease of the functional residual capacity of the patient. There will be coagulation abnormalities because of hyperthermia. So there, we can expect decrease of platelet count and prolonged PTINR in the post-op period, which usually settle down around 72 hours after surgery. The hypermetabolic state caused by hyperthermia can lead to metabolic acidosis, increase the lactate levels in these patients, and there will be increased oxygen extraction as well as consumption. And the use of various chemotherapeutic agents can lead to uh, metabolic abnormalities like hypomagnesemia can be used post uh, uh, use of cisplatin for high peg, along with the risk of systemic toxicity. So because of all these risk factors to all the organ systems, we need some special monitoring for these patients. So apart from the standard American Society of Anesthesiology monitors, we need to look for the core body temperature for these patients, the most important monitor in a patient undergoing CRS high peg. And then we need to have an arterial line in C2 to monitor B2B to -beat radiation of the blood pressure. So this uh, this transducer, this is a special transducer which can be used with the arterial line to measure the various dynamic parameters of fluid responsiveness. So this transducer will give us the value of the stroke volume variation, the cardiac index as well as the stroke volume index and we can also calculate the SVR using the CVP value from this monitor. So all these parameters will help to guide the fluid management in these patients. And Apart from these monitors, the most important another monitoring is the urine output. It should be done early during the CRS phase and every 15 minutes during the HIPEC phase because of increases of API in these patients. And we can also use monitors like uh, thromboelastography for monitoring the coagulation profile of the patient if it is available. This is a point of care testing to assess the coagulation parameters. So coming to the intra concerns, basically during the induction, if the patient is having the cytis, there will be increased intra-abdominal pressure. And post-induction, the patient is at increased risk of aspiration. So we go for rapid sequence induction in these patients. For thermoregulation, as we've already uh, discussed, like there are increased risk of temperature fluctuations and we monitor the core body temperature. So during the CRS phase to prevent the hypothermia, we use convective warming devices like bear huggers. We use warm IV fluids and we can increase the ambient OT temperature. And to prevent hypothermia during the HIPEC phase, it can be uh, done 15 minutes before starting the HIPEC. We set the warming device back to the ambient or the off mode. We use cold IV fluids at a temperature around 6 degrees Celsius and we can use ice packs in the axilla. Still, after doing 
all these things, if the temperature increases above 39 degrees Celsius, we can ask the perfusionist to decrease the temperature of the chemotherapy. So, for the perioperative pain management, we know pain management is one of the main factors which lead to early recovery of the patient and will also decrease the risk of post op pulmonary complications as well as decrease the risk of DVT so, and also increase the post op mobility of the patient. So, the mainstay of pain management will be a thoracic epidural technique where we can use a combination of local anesthetic with opioids for perioperative pain management or if epidural is either contraindicated or undesired by the patient, we can go for IV techniques using various drugs like uh, IV infusion of opioids along with lignocaine because lignocaine also has anti-inflammatory properties and can be used as an uh, analgesic in the intraoperative period also. Now, if apart from all these uh, uh, modalities, if the pain management is not adequate, we can go for a patient-controlled analgesia device in the post op period after extubation, where the patient himself or herself will decide the analgesic doses. And this is given by a, uh, there is a software in the system which uh, gives the demand doses as required by the patient. So the patient presses the device and the analgesic is given to the patient. So, the fluid management, as we know, CRS helping is associated with significant fluid shifts. So, the term used is optovolemia, that is, it is to be individualized as per the patient requirement. And we basically use a more directed fluid therapy using the non invasive cardiac output monitoring. And uh, the aim of urine output during the CRS phase should be around 0.5 ml per kg per hour. Level per kg per hour during the hypoic phase and post hypoic should be at least 1 to 2 ml per kg per hour. So basically, we use balanced all solutions to manage the intraoperative fluids, and albumin can be used as a colloid of choice, especially in the post op period. If the patient has an albumin level of less than 3, in the post op period, we can give albumin transfusion as well. So, coagulation abnormalities as are expected. And also, there can be increases of DVT also in these patients. Therefore, coagulation monitoring is carried out uh, perioperatively in these patients. And we can also use peri uh, point of care testing like thromboelastograph to decide what all to transfuse. Now, there are some safety concerns in these patients because of the generation of aerosols and vapors, especially if we are going for an open or colosium technique as compared to the closed technique. So, uh, these uh, inhalation of these Asian agents can have deleterious effects on the body, and the high risk groups should therefore be excluded from the high tech team, and the containers for disposal should be leak free, leak proof, and labels labeled as cytotoxic agent. Now, the major post op concern the main concern is that we want early extubation and early recovery of the patient. And this can be achieved if we take care of all the other parameters, that is, we take care of the fluid and fluid dynamics post operatively. Because the patient in the initial 48 hours will have massive fluid losses, so we need to continue with appropriate fluid management and look for any electrolyte imbalance post operatively. The renal parameters need to be monitored daily to look for the, uh, there is a, always a risk of API. The patient should be started on early nutrition, early ammunition, and with thromboprophylaxis, and appropriate perioperative analgesia will help for early recovery and improved outcomes. So the ERAS enhanced recovery after surgery in HIPEC, the, the guidelines were uh, published in European Journal of Surgical Oncology in 2020 as two parts, the pre-op and post-op concerns. So basically these are uh, just the guidelines which are little different from the main guidelines which were given initially for the colorectal surgery. The red ones are the strong recommendations. That is in the pre-op assessment of a patient who has to undergo CRS HIPEC. We need to look for the cardiac risk using appropriate scores, like we use revised cardiac risk index in these patients. There should be a screening called OSA and also frailty screening. That is a clin clinical frailty score should be used. And it, ha it has been suggested that a patient who has a clinical frailty score of more than four should not undergo CRS HIPEC. And intraoperatively, the strong recommendations are to use epidural analgesia along with cardiac output monitoring for goal directed fluid therapy and use of catecholamines. Uh, the prevention of intra hypothermia as well as hypothermia to decrease the delta temperature. Uh, the restrictive transfusion strategy is uh, recommended and early extubation is recommended. So, uh, uh, the post operative period thoracic epidural should be continued for at least three to five days post operatively using doses of local anesthetic and short acting opioids. 
the mechanical and extended pharmacological prophylaxis is a strong recommendation and the patient should be uh, mobilized as early as possible with physiotherapy started uh, on page post of day 2 and a regular audit should be conducted for quality improvement there has been no consensus on the preemptive use of ffp in these patients and for uh, for uh, specific re recommendations for the hypeg, a cisplatin dose of more than 240 mg should not be given because of the risk of associated nephrotoxicity and uh, increased morbidity. Parenteral sodium thiosulfate has been recommended in patients who have to undergo hypeg with cisplatin. And uh, the use of dopamine and loop diuretics for renal protection has not been recommended. And a mitomycin dose of more than 40 mg should only be used in patients without risk factors. So to conclude, a careful patient selection done by both the cell surgeon as, the, and, as well as the anesthesiologist, the use of prehabilitation and optimization to increase the preoperative officer status, the use of invasive hemodynamic monitoring, especially cardiac output monitoring is a must in these cases and thermoregulation and management of massive fluid shifts with post-operative care in the ICU. And we know that higher PCI scores can lead to increased complications with increased duration of surgery, increased blood loss, increased use of vasopressors, and teamwork will all obviously lead to improved outcomes. <laughs> Where, along with the surgeon and anesthetist, all the right health workers like physiotherapists, dietitians, and the nursing staff will help to improve the post-operative outcome. Thank you so much. <laughs> Excellent talk. Uh, are there any new guidelines uh, for a perioperative period uh, from anesthesia point of view? So there is a society of Hong Kong anesthesia and perioperative care in India itself. So they have published the guidelines in 2019. So uh, they'll re keep on re renew reviewing it, but uh, there has been a publication of Indian guidelines for management of CRS hypic as well. And these are the ERAS guidelines which have been published. I think in Ames you had a uh, published a paper in 2019 about guidelines for anesthetic uh, dissertations for Yes, sir. It was combined with Tata and Ames. Tata, yeah. Yeah. So uh, the Tata group as well as the Ames group. Yes. Uh, it's a good presentation. I just wanted to add something as a surgeon. Uh, so basically, the common mis mis misconception is that, you know, HIPEC. So HIPEC is not the main, uh, you know, the Achilles heel of the surgery. It is the CRS. So when you have a high PCI, patient, especially non-ovarian cancers like pseudomyxomas, mesotheliomas, uh, extensive multiple bowel resections, rotor mesentery, uh, you know, uh, resections, uh, diaphragmatic resections, all these things are highly morbid procedures. And they are the ones that actually determine the outcomes when you look at the uh, morbidity and mortality after CS and HIPEC. Uh, it's the teamwork, like you mentioned, is a very um, important aspect. It's good to keep uh, very smooth working in, in uh, pre-operative, intra-op, post-operative, all those things that you mentioned, uh, mm -hmm. including the surgical probe for core body temperature as well as the arterial, uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, it was a good talk, and I think it's, we, took, we have something good to take home. Thank you, sir. Any question from the audience? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you all. I request the chairpersons to please say Dr. Kiran, please. Dr. Ritesh Pruthi, Senior uh, Surgical Oncologist, Max Mohali, and Dr. Kunal Jain, Assistant Professor, Medical Oncology, to please felicitate our chairpersons. I request you to please take photo. <coughs> we have Dr. P. S. Nen.
Dr. Jaspinda. Dr. Praveen Yadav. Dr. Vinay Samuel. Dr. Anshima Bansi. Thank you all. Going forward with the last discussion of the day, we have amongst us experts from surgical, medical, the gynecologists, surgeons, and from various fields for the panel discussion on the ovarian cancer. And for the same, I would request our following chairperson to please come on stage. We have Dr. Praneet, radiation oncologist for Paris Hospital. Dr. Sanjeev Bansal, surgical oncologist for Tinda. Dr. Pooja Tandran, associate professor, department of OBGY DMCH. I request the chairpersons to be in the center. The panelists can come in the corners and we'll be able to view the screen then. I request the chairperson to please introduce our speaker, moderators, and our panelists. A very good evening to all present. So we are going to have a nice, interesting panel discussion on ovarian cancer. First of all, I would like to invite Dr. Alok K. Goyal. He is the moderator for the panel. He is presently working as assistant professor in medical oncology and he is working in Homi Baba Cancer Center, Mullapur, Punjab. Dr. Alok. Next, I would like to invite the panelists. Dr. Priyanshu Chaudhary, working as consultant in medical oncology, Shelby Hospital, Mohali. Dr. Kanupriya Jain, she is working as Associate Professor in Department of OB Gaini at DMCH. Dr. Arvind, Consultant Surgical Oncology at Max Mohali. I welcome Dr. Siddharth Prakash, Associate Professor, Interventional Radiology, DMCNH. Dr. Chitresh Agrawal, Consultant Medical Oncology, Paras Hospital, Panchkulam. Dr. Anuj Bansal, Consultant Medical Oncology, Punjab Cancer Center, Bathinda. Dr. Navdeep Singh, Consultant Medical Oncology, CCA, Ludhiana. Dr. Vikramjit Singh, Associate Professor in Surgical Oncology at Homi Baba Center Hospital, Sangroor. And Dr. Pramit Kaur, Professor of Pathology in DMCH. I welcome all the panelists, and we shall start with the panel discussion. Uh, uh, good evening all. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizer for this opportunity. So I have been given the most difficult task of uh, having the last session. So I am keeping you away from your food and other things. So I will keep it easy and short. And uh, I will try to learn from our expert panelists and try to drive home the data and how can we use it in clinics going forward. So. This was my reaction when I got the topic. That's easy. I just need to review some topics. I just need to brush up on some things and I will be done. But this is me on the day of the panel. I am all confused, all go. And I will need my expert to sort out these issues for me and to help me in finding, uh, making some consensus on what we should do and how should we treat our patients when they come to us. Just on a lighter note, this is now the the now it has become crowded and we need to understand how to rationally use these agents for better patient management. So uh, let's start with our case. So our patient is a 48 year old female, fit patient, ECOG1 with no comorbidities, no addiction and no family history of malignancy. 
presented to the outpatient department with complaint of abdominal pain with distension since last few days. She, she was ordered a CCD abdomen outside, the report of which says adnexal mass, omental and peritoneal deposits, and ascites. I would like to open this uh, case to my panelists now. Uh, what next? Is this history adequate or do you need anything further to go ahead? So we can start with our surgical oncologist. Any of them can take the picture. Hello. Yeah, so uh, from here on, I would uh, like to have a pathological diagnosis of some sort. Uh, whether <coughs> we can tap the ascites and get a cytology and a cell block with an IHC on it, that would be really nice before we plan anything uh, uh, further down the uh, Do you need anything else on your uh, imaging to better find a differential diagnosis or to go ahead or do you want the work to be done by your pathologist to uh, for the diagnosis i would want uh, the cytology cell block and then i'll consider what modality of staging i would want to go ahead with Al along with tumor markers and uh, another set of workup would be required so uh, what are your differentials which you are thinking of on on this history See, we oncologists have a very uh, narrow vision that everything that presents with a abdominal mass and uh, ascites is a CA ovary. It would be a tuberculosis also. Uh, okay. So, so, so taking it to be a carcinoma ovary, so based, uh, to see the type of the carcinoma ovary, would you need any more information on the CT abdomen so as to help your pathologist who will write clinical correlate in the report uh, down? So, <laughs> yeah. So, Imaging can be reviewed for uh, any scalloping of the liver, any uh, indication whether there is any uh, mucus inside the abdomen and uh, whether there are some classical radiological signs of pseudomyxoma formation or why this thing has happened. So I presume we don't have anything more than the radiological diagnosis that you have presented. So from here on, that was my suggestion why I would want to answer. Uh, Dr. Vikram, uh, what tumor markers will you like to order in this 48-year female with this presentation? Uh, I would like to see 20 times. I see 99. So you are thinking of a mucinous as well as a serious pathology which could be there. And uh, so what are the investigation? Dr. Avind has already... Any panelists would like to add anything? Uh, yeah. Sir, so a chest imaging and a mammal mammography. So, uh, I would like to add that as a gynecologist, we are most likely to see such patients first in our OPDs. So first encounter might be with us or maybe in a gastro OPD. And uh, we must also initially look at the non-cancer diagnosis as well. And uh, getting a detailed CT, what type of mass is it? Is it bilateral? Is it completely solid, cystic, mixed? Is it tubo ovarian or just ovarian? and uh, how much it is, uh, uh, how much peritoneal uh, involvement is there, is, how, what are the planes with the rest of the tissues, that will really help us between malignant and non-malignant. And she's rather uh, young and uh, I would at least not want her to have a CA, so I would do a thorough checkup for non-cancerous uh, things as well. So tumor markers, everything will go and with the uh, cytic fluid, I would also order a CB NAT and uh, ADA along with that and cultures. So ruling out some uh, rare infections as well as tuberculosis and in fact if simple PID could also be there and a history of fever is also very relevant. Any history of previous surgeries, any history of any interventions. Uh, endometrosis one thing and which could have secondary infections. So uh, these are all the things that should also be considered when you see the patient for the first time. Thank Thanks a lot, ma'am. That is what I want to bring the, uh, uh, out. That uh, we, as uh, as Dr. Evans said, we as uh, oncologists have very very narrow field of vision, and we always look at a patient as uh, oncology patient. But we need to rule out all these cases when the patient come to us. So as an anecdote, uh, when I was doing my MD medicine, so a patient with a simple pneumonia went to a cardiologist 
coded angiography, the angioplasty, and didn't find anything, and the patient still have symptoms. Then he went to a local MBBS doctor who gave some antibiotics, and the patient was fine. So we need to look into this. Uh, so we then ordered a proper CT with perhaps abdominal pelvis imaging. We showed a 5 into 4 centimeter solid cystic mass. It was only a left adnexal mass, and the right, adnexal, right ovary was normal, which was seen. There was mild ascites and some omental and peritoneal deposits were seen. As uh, mentioned by our panelists, we did a CA-195 level, which was high at 780, and the CA and CA-19.9 were within normal limit, more or less. A biopsy was done from the omental deposit, which showed a high-grade serous carcinoma ovary. Uh, so, uh, uh, sorry, a food pathologist. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. So, uh, how easy it is to diagnose or to differentiate a mucinous or a serious carcinoma when we, you get a biopsy report and what is an adequate biopsy you will say you need to comment on all these things? So, firstly, I think uh, Dr. Nagarji, uh, Dr. that is missing here, a cytic tab would have been important here to see whether it is a malignant uh, ascites or it's just a non-malignant ascites like Dr. Kanupriya says, we do encounter a lot of cases which say a DD of malignancy with a with TB because it's endemic in a country. And in that kind of a case, the fluid would show a lymphocyte rich effusion. Uh, so as it is going on these days, we would like to do ancillary techniques in which cell block would be at very high on the cards. So we do a cell block and uh, we look into the cell block and we do we can even do immunos on that. And uh, then a lot of times we get FNACs and FNACs with biopsies in the same setting. And FNAC we could not go beyond uh, on morphology calling it malignant or not malignant. And that is all we could do on a FNA and uh, we can say it's an adenocarcinoma. Then going on to a biopsy, it would be by and large the same. We could just say it's an adenocarcinoma. And without immunos, it's very difficult to make a diagnosis of a high-grade serous carcinoma. Though if it is serous in nature, we have some uh, indicators which would say high-grade, meaning a mitosis of more than 12 per 10 hyperfield, uh, nuclear pleomorphism where the nuclear and isonucleosis is three times, and uh, immunos would show a diffuse uh, P53. So all that would be required to make a diagnosis of high-grade serous carcinoma. It's not so simple that you just look at the biopsy and say it's a high-grade serous, right? Uh, mucinous, of course, we'll see a lot of extracellular mucin there. Mucinous carcinomas are quite notorious to be very bland looking. And sometimes uh, we do need to do immunos to check it out. And we always ask for the tumor markers, of course, from the biochemical, biochemistry department. We give a lot of importance to CA 125, though I know it could be high in certain non-neoplastic uh, conditions as well. Otherwise, uh, we a lot of times we need to final diagnosis of a high-grade serous carcinoma on a crooked biopsy. I'm just debating from the case a little bit. How, uh, how easy or difficult it is to differentiate a mucinous carcinoma of ovary from a mucinous carcinoma of GI origin when we are differentiating from a primary mucinous ovary? It is fairly difficult and of course with the help of a lot of clinical clinical findings, imaging findings and immunos, we need to make this differential. So, so this patient, uh, then uh, how will you proceed further and what is the rationale? Whether you will go for a primary debulking surgery or a neoadjuvant chemotherapy in this patient? And is there any difference uh, which is made by the treatment choice here in this patient? See, uh, the CT scan has not given me a full information. It's just a five-centimeter mass. We have to make some of the CT scan. But we have to make the CT scan. We have to make the CT scan. We have to see any features of the device. We have to make the CT scan. We have to make the CT scan. So I would like to uh, ask Dr. Siddharth uh, yeah. So, what CT findings can help a surgeon in deciding whether it could be operable well up front or not?
course taking a biopsy from the ovarian masses is pretty difficult if there is a solid component it's very uh, straight forward but taking from uh, perhaps a, a purely cystic lesions it's pretty difficult to take biopsies perhaps most of the time it comes out to be inadequate material perhaps we aspirate the material and maybe send the fluid also for uh, cytic fluid for cytology and all those for uh, all those things beside this if we have to see we have just look at the deposits perhaps in the pleural or in perhaps in the peripatic deposits which you can see which may decide the operability for the surgeons. Dr. Sanjeev if you could add how will you decide an operability in a patient if he comes up front to you or when you will send it to your medical oncologist or your joint chemotherapy? Kind of uh, if, uh, if uh, from the CT scan if uh, from the CT scan films or you're talking with the radiologist if I could remove uh, the adequate cytodactyl surgery, then I will preferably go for the primary cytodactyl surgery. If uh, I feel I could not do the uh, appropriate cytodactyl surgery, then definitely I will refer the patient for the neurogen chemotherapy. And after this cycle, we will assess for the operability. Dr. Abhin, if you would like to. Sir, I would like to have a uh, detailed discussion with the patient and see what is the performance status of the patient. I would try to get something known as, uh, known as a radiological PCI first. And uh, if that is high, and especially given this ascites being there, if it is significant on the scan, I would want to uh, go ahead with NACT first. I can uh, factor in doing a staging laparoscopy and keeping it as an option that if I find sufficient evidence that I can proceed ahead, there is not much of a peritoneal disease, I can proceed with the surgery in the same setting or I would do just a staging lab, map the disease properly and complement my findings of uh, PCI determination on the imaging and if indicated then go for NACT. That will give me three benefits. One that my patient will not have a pre-floating cancer cells in the situs if they are already present there when I operate the patient. Patient will have some time to build up nutritionally, physically and uh, I will be more correct offering the patient CRS hypec uh, because this will be a stage 3 ovary at least if not stage 4 detected anywhere else. However, there is one thing which is incomplete though it is uncommon bone study has not been done yet so either this should be complemented with a pet ct or with a bone scan that is what are coming uh, in user practice do we go for a bone scan or pet scan in every patient of carcinoma ovary which come to us i have not ordered in my last 10 patients a yeah. bone scan or PET scan for a carcinoma ovary patient so it's like pet scan is a quite a comprehensive investigation for CA ovary at least, uh, especially in cases where we are not having much of a supracolic compartment disease, we are not uh, wondering too much about splenectomy hoga, nahi hoga, arterial uh, uh, configurations kya hai, or when there are no doubts about having parenchymal metastasis. For all those things, a PET scan is a very decent uh, investigation and uh, Right now, it is uh, very commonly used. So, do you complement every patient who's come with a CC for uh, abdominal pelvis to do a PET scan always before going for a surgery? Uh, in my practice, yes, because uh, but that it may always be agreed that if patient is not symptomatic for any bone lesion, ALP is normal, you may avoid a bone scan. Any other surgeon has a different opinion, or they also go for a PET scan? In these cases. We usually go for the CT scan, thorax, abdominal, pelvis contrast study. That is a usual radiologic investigation I order for the COV patients. Uh, I may be practicing at Brenda, we are dealing with mere, more poor patients, they can't afford, and the PET scan is not available at Brenda also. Uh, my point of view may be different, but I usually order CT scan, thorax, abdominal, pelvis contrast study only. But even in ideal situation, I don't think even in a resource uh, full setting, uh, a PET scan is always recommended in the guidelines. Uh, if I am faulted somewhere, it's not a mandatory uh, uh, recommendation. It's an optional imaging, and if a patient has come with, say, only a CT abdomen, 
we might go, uh, go for a PET CCT rather than uh, getting a uh, CT chest. I think we need to see what are the complaints of the patient. If the patient is uh, having bone pain, then definitely we need to get uh, do a bone scan or PET so scan for that. Will be middle aged female or elderly female who will have some component of osteoporosis and will have bone pains. But if the patient is definitely complaining of bone pain and recent onset in the last uh, uh, one month or like that, then definitely we need to get a scan done. Otherwise, routine practice, we don't. I don't do uh, any scan for the bone. For lung, also in my practice, if the patient is dyspneic, then only I get a CT scan done. Otherwise, I normally do a chest X-ray done for a C ovary case. So my understanding was that ovarian meds are mostly lytic and CT will, most of them pick it up and sclerotic meds are uh, uncommon so a pet might not add up a value in every patient who will, even with a bone med, but with, with a on a CT. So, so uh, just to make one point, so if a patient is operable, is there any choice between NACT or a primary debulking surgery? If a patient is fit for a primary debulking surgery, will you take a patient for primary debulking surgery or will you send it for NACT anyhow? See, this patient is a nasopedia, like this look at the like Pragotis Kadira is there. We chose that I can go with the complete cytoduction, I will go with the primary surgery. So, but I want to put a point so that if a patient is fit or operable for a CC0, you will go for a primary debulking surgery. Primary. They know indication for NACT apart from an inoperable patient or a patient, a patient is difficult to get a CC0. A patient is not fit for surgery. Then okay. So this patient has uh, underwent a upfront total abdominal hysterectomy with bilateral self pharyngeophrectomy with omentectomy and peritoneal washing. The citing fluid cytology was positive for magnet cell. So uh, is this surgery a complete surgery or we do? What are the components of an ideal cytoreduction or a primary debulking surgery for a serious ovarian carcinoma? In this case, they have not taken, uh, well, at least it's not mentioned, uh, random peritoneal biopsies and uh, uh, upfront TAH, BSO. Um, I would actually like to know what was the intraoperative findings also, then if the disease spread was uh, not anywhere else, at least the lymph nodes would have been uh, assessed. So what, uh, so forget this case, so what will, what will you look? In when you're doing a surgery interop to decide what all you need to remove. We uh, do a exploratory laparotomy for these cases uh, for the therapeutic thing. Laparoscopic cytoreduction primary or otherwise is uh, more of a contraindication. So with the uh, exploratory laparotomy we do a TAH, BSO and bilateral uh, uh, pelvic node dissection paraiotic uh, lymph node sampling we, or assessment in some ma manner that whether there are any enlarged nodes there, peritoneal <coughs> washing, omentectomy and random peritoneal biopsies. Okay. So uh, according to our surgeon, it's a CC0. Can I ask? Yes, sir. Okay, okay. Dr. Lok, uh, if we are going to proceed with surgery in this case, uh, what of doing the biopsy up front, if the surgeon feel, felt confident that he'll be doing the primary cytodactyl, so was biopsy required? So can, can I ask? I can open this to the So yeah. because uh, we confirm the diagnosis with biopsy only because C is, this is a case of C ovary. It may be a metastatic disease from some other tumor. So on FNSC we can't say that this is a ovarian cancer. So I think biopsy I was must. Talking about uh, laparotomy. Straight away a laparotomy. So if it is a stage four, you can say uh, there, gallbladder there is, cancer or some other cancer, then okay, uh, okay. that is not uh, recommended. No? Krukenberg tumor, like then surgery is not required. Surgery should not be done. Krukenberg, CS, stomach, upper GI endoscopy. There is no finding. What what else? Right. It's not done in this case. No? It's not done in this case. No, 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 no. What I am trying to say, classical teaching, they were telling us there are three or four cancers in which FNC or biopsy is not required. Ovary being one of them or not. Yes, the so, one of them. Uh, so, but, so that, that's what I have said. Sir, as ma'am already said, yeah, we yeah. as oncologists have a very narrow vision and there are a lot of non-oncological diagnosis which we always need to mind. And a surgery is a morbid procedure. 
and so when we are calling a patient and taking up a, a surgery laparoscopy laparoscopy followed by surgery no, or no, still we not have to have a tissue diagnosis before better better uh, say this patient tissue diagnosis classical teaching is when you have the ovarian mass yes. you don't need to do the yeah but in this case part. they have the mental disease and they have taken a biopsy from the mental disease not from yeah. the mass yeah. so from so not going to upstage my stage Yes. So by taking biopsy, I am not going to have that going to additional advantage. Sir, so, there is an alternative. So, so if if there was no mental mass, just a simple ovarian mass, what uh, yes. no mental? No needed. Yes, no then needed. then definitely. Then FNSC you should require. I think directly you should take out the ovary. If it is ovarian mass, yes. single ovarian mass. Yes. Uh, then I think FNSC is also not required. Again, again the discussion with our gynecologist, ma'am. Uh, if there was a single ovarian mass, no peritoneal mental mass, no ascites. Then will we proceed for surgery again or not? Yes, I totally agree with you. If there is a single mass, yes, and uh, there is a possibility of malignancy as well as a non-malignant diagnosis, we should not bypass. In fact, it may be uh, a stage one which will which might rupture. Yes, and uh, then it's always a better idea to open her up and maybe do a frozen. Yes, if you want to proceed with complete surgery at the same time, right. if you have that facility, or if you don't have frozen, remove that ovary. If you want to do a fertility per preservation and maybe do a second sitting surgery. If you don't want any fertility preservation, you remove everything at that time. At 48, we might go for... No, she doesn't need fertility pre yeah. preservation or even ovarian preservation. Yes. So, uh, a frozen would be a very good option in a lady who has a plus minus diagnosis and we should not poke a patient uh, prior to that. If it's a stage 1 disease, uh, if it does, if it's a malignancy, we should directly go for surgery. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. So, if I may add, uh, you can avoid the biopsy even by if you have a cytic fluid positive and you have a ratio of, you know, CA 125 over CEA more than 25 with a normal UG and uh, chronoscopy, then, you, then also you can avoid, uh, avoid uh, biopsy. Okay. okay. So, uh, so, what adjuvant therapy you will offer to this patient now? So the HPR came out to be a high grade serous astroma ovary and uh, ascites fluid cytology was already positive. So what adjuvant therapy will you plan for this patient or will you need further more tests to decide on your adjuvant therapy? So 3C and the adjuvant treatment would be uh, 6 cycles of paclitaxel and carbocratin uh, plus minus bevacizumab. So that discussion has to be done. We have to see the financial condition of the patient. We have to say that uh, we have to explain the PFS benefit and no OS benefit. And still, if the patient uh, agrees, then bevacizumab is optional. But six cycles of packet X and carbocatin is the uh, treatment of choice. In addition, I would like to check uh, for uh, the HRD testing. So, which will encompass the genomic instability and the practice. So, so anything, uh, uh, CC0 section or mild ascites, anything, uh, so you, how will you decide clinically on the as as the patient is affordable for? So generally see, uh, nowadays the trend is to offer uh, in view of PFS benefit some drugs uh, during maintenance phase. So if a patient is affording, uh, I would give Vivacizumab. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is not a non bulky disease, ascites Asc Asc is minimal. So may not be, uh, I don't give Vivacizumab in that case. If it's a massive ascites or a bulky disease, then I only I try to give Vivacizumab. Any, any differently you proceed? So stage four inner situs, that's a group had shown with the post hoc analysis that's shown survival benefit. So, so ascites, uh, how easy it is to quantify ascites and to decide based on that whether you will clinically I would I see that if the clinically you have a moderate to you know massive ascites, then I would like to and it's positive for many things definitely. Okay. What is the level of cytoreduction reported on the operative? findings yeah. whether C it was cc0 C C C I, 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 so it's a cc0 C okay. which was which was the surgeon said okay. cc0 cc0 yeah it was cc0 so uh, as uh, dr uh, chitresh already said we will order some uh, genetic tests to further decide on our adjuvant and maintenance therapy so so and uh, so further uh, any role of dose dense chemotherapy you said you will give uh, three six cycles of three weekly exactly carbo. So, is there any role of dose less chemotherapy in these patients, or will you choose? How will you choose some patient for dose? Forty-eight case metabolic positive surgery well, and there is no possibility problem. I will not. You will not. 
not use uh, dose. And so, so in what scenarios, uh, leave this case behind, will you prefer a dose dose chemotherapy? For patient who is, uh, you know, on a weekly schedule only for those patients who are, uh, you know, not able to tolerate three weekly doses and bordering performance status. Uh, and elderly uh, people who uh, we think that they are not good candidates for a uh, three weekly dose. The other two trials actually had a discordant results, you know, the, uh, between the Japanese and okay. uh, the Icon 8. Okay. So, so uh, any role of, uh, so we have already had uh, a big topic on uh, intraperitoneal chemotherapy and hyper, but at the time when we have bevacizumab and PARP inhibitors which are coming up and the trials for IP chemotherapy and HIPEP are done in the era when the chemotherapy backbone was only peckly carbo. So what additional benefit and where do you see uh, interventional chemotherapy and HIPEP now in the era of PARP inhibitors and bevacizumab maintenance which is coming now in a big way? The correct answer to that because all the IPEC kind of uh, IP as you rightly mentioned was in the era when there was no role of uh, no PARP inhibitors in bevacizumab. Now for a patient who has been uh, optimally cyclic uh, reduced, uh, at least in my center, I don't have this, uh, and I, I have not used uh, IP and IPEC in my patients. Yeah, so when you are in AIMS, so, uh, how will you so, decide patients on IP versus IV? Uh, sir, abdominal limited disease, uh, first of all, and then uh, uh, it used to be actually a lot dependent upon, uh, you know, the consultant, actually the surgical oncologist who was saying because it was done by some and not by some, so it's actually a plus minus. So we have a great session on interpretive chemotherapy and we had discussed the benefits uh, in terms of PFS and OS which the earlier studies have shown for interpretive on chemotherapy. But uh, as Dr. Chitresh already said, but in the era of bevacizumab and PARP inhibitors are coming, we don't know the answer whether that advantage for interpretive chemotherapy will stand and we all know that uh, interpretive chemotherapy comes with its own share of toxicities and in all the trials, the quality of life is worse in patients who have received IP chemotherapy as compared to IV chemotherapy. Uh, also not available at every center. Yeah, yeah. cost and availability is also sure. awesome. and sure. Sure. Uh, So, when you are planning to add bevacizumab maps to these patients, uh, the, what is the dose? and number of cycles of bevacizumab we offer because the GOG 218 and IPON 7 gives different doses and different maintenance. So what is the schedule which you use and what is the rationale for that? So 7.5 mg per kg is the dose which I use and uh, 12 cycles usually. So you we have data, IPON 7? Yeah, yeah, we have data 15 versus 30 also just now we had came and 15 is uh, as good as 30. So probably a shorter maybe 12 to 15. So as we uh, as we were discussing about a dose then so we have uh, the Japanese study which showed that uh, uh, experimental dose as arm of paclitaxel carboplatin was shown to have a superior PFS and overall survival as compared to a three weekly paclitaxel plus carboplatin with a hazard ratio which is healthy at around 21 percent relative benefit of dose dense over a normal chemotherapy. Then we have the mito seven regime which used a, a dose a reduced dose of paclitaxel 60 milligram per meter square. And it showed that it is non inferior to a uh, three weekly packet access carburetin regime, and thus it remains a viable option for our frail and elderly patient who we think might not tolerate a packet access carboplatin. And what is important to see that the quality of life studies or a factor scale shows that the quality of life is better as compared to a three weekly regime on those patients who receive this. So, this is a very viable regime which can be used in a lot of our patients who come to us in very advanced stage with a very bulky disease and who require chemotherapy upfront also. Uh, the iPhone 8, but that is what Dr. Pianchu also said. We have two trials which showed a benefit of dose dense chemotherapy, but we have a iPhone 8 trial which showed that a, a weekly uh, or three weekly regime doesn't have much of a difference when we add bevacizumab. So when we are adding bevacizumab to the chemotherapy backbone, whether we use a dose dense regime or a three weekly regime doesn't make a difference. So, so just to give up a, a take home message, so in a patient who is frail or when we cannot afford bevacizumab, a, do, a dose dense a weekly paclizine might be an option for these patients. 
looking just at uh, that neuropathy might be a little higher when we give packet axel at a weekly dose as compared to three weekly dose. And as we give more cycles of packet axel, the chance of hypersensitivity reaction which occur with packet axel becomes a little more, which is not being taken care when we discuss these trials. So these need to be taken care in real life scenario when we choose a low dense disease. Otherwise, it's a very viable option when our patients cannot afford a bariatric back backbone in these cases. Uh, so that is what the gynecological cancer intergroup also says. Ki a low dense intravenous packet axial can be an alternative reference group to intravenous carb cathlete. And uh, also a mito 7 regime can be used. But they say for whom level 1 evidence of benefit exists, I couldn't find who are those patients for whom this level 1 evidence exists. So if my panelists can help me or can say for whom you will, as they mentioned, will you start to use a weekly regime more than a three weekly regime? I couldn't find uh, even when I look in the literature what where is the level one evidence for weekly practice. Because as we have discussed, if the patient's performance status is poor, then one indication, but that is on the lower side of the list. And if you're able to use bevacizumab concurrently, then it hardly matters. If the patient is not able to afford bevacizumab and still you want to give the best to the patient, then probably for some group of patients you can give a big deal uh, in those dense cases. Okay. So there are also pharmacogenomic differences between uh, the patient population between ICON-8 and the JCOG trial and because we don't know right now whether this, it was the Japanese, um, probably they benefited more or because the European ICON and they did bad. So we don't know that. Definitely that gives us one of the reasons to uh, collaborate and develop Indian data which might give us more answers in our Indian scenario. What is the best regime to provide for our patients? So as we have already discussed, the Yoji and the ICON-7 showed that map increases PFS in patients when added, but there is no uh, statistically significant OS benefit in these patients. And they use a different map dose as well as the duration. And uh, as the Dr. Chitresh and Dr. Bianchu is, we are, most of the medical oncologists use 7.5 MD per kg for one year because that feels that saves cost and we don't know the incremental benefit of using a higher dose for a higher time and the side effect profile with bevacizumab at a higher dose which is also a troublesome thing. So uh, as uh, mentioned, so uh, bevacizumab has come from the meta-analysis uh, or subgroup analysis from the ICON-7, a uh, high group patient, high risk patient who are uh, pa uh, stage 3 patient who are not properly cytoreduced, reduced, uh, inoperable stage 3 disease or any stage 4 disease are the subgroup of patient which seems to benefit most uh, predominantly from Bevacizumab and, and, and in low, group, uh, low risk patient who are operable uh, stage 3 or uh, optimally cytoreduced reduced stage 3, Bevacizumab seems not to be providing much of a benefit over a chemotherapy backbone. Uh, so that is what uh, also the ESMO ESCO consensus says. They mention both the doses and they leave it to us to decide on what uh, can be give, uh, what to use. And they also say that we are scared of using Bevacizumab in a neurogen setting because of the healing issues and uh, the bleeding risk which occurs during surgery. But it, it has been used in neurogen setting and it can safely be used. But we have to keep a gap of four to six weeks between the last Bevacizumab dose and neurogen. Practical considerations we are not able to use you know, because first cycle you give and third cycle if it is to be operated in 28 days, it is very difficult to time. So you actually skip it in the third it's cycle, cycle yeah. so and then you are only able to, able to give for two, in two cycles and then you have to actually skip it off if you want to do the time which I do that. So we have already have a discussion on interpreting chemotherapy. So we have conflicting results from where trials, uh, so where initial trials work 172 which showed that uh, Interpretive chemotherapy is better than IV chemotherapy, and we have meta-analysis in 2006 which showed that interpretive chemotherapy is better than IV chemotherapy in terms uh, of uh, EFS as well as uh, OS. Uh, at the same time, we have conflict result from USA and Europe, we will not go into it. And then we have uh, 252 which in the era of Bevacizumab showed that IV chemotherapy might not be adding benefit over IV chemotherapy. Uh, so this patient uh, received six cycles of athlete axial carboplatin adjuvant therapy. What next? Uh, what uh, will you offer this patient some maintenance therapy? Uh, this patient is germline BRCA positive. So, 
ओला पैर में ढूंढ कर पैर बदलते हैं तो हमने इन ब्रैकेट पॉजिटिव ओला पैर इस दी वी विल नॉट कंसीडर ढूंढ कर पैर ये नीरा पैर ये नीरा अवेलेबिलिटी नीरा अवेलेबिलिटी इस इश्यू फर्स्ट लाइन डेटा इस मोस्ट कंसीडरिंग डेटा इस ओला पैर अर्थिना अर्थिना मोनो अबाउट ओला पैर ओला पैर ओला पैर एंड इन योर प्रैक्टिस व if a patient doesn't has any cost constraints, what will you offer to your patient? HRD. HRD. So you think HR, HRD is better than HR becoming up more patients who is it? So in uh, uh, constraint of time, I will not go into details of these tests, but uh, HRD seems to be the one which picks up, pick up according to most of the trials, uh, the most comprehensive patient, most comprehensive uh, patient list who will, be, who will be going to benefit from PARP inhibitors as compared to those who will not uh, benefit from PARP inhibitors is the HRP group. And with the sort of coming of uh, generic Rupaparin, probably we would be better inclined to do HRD in the long run it would be saving. And one thing which, uh, we need to keep in mind that uh, based on the test which we are using, whether we are using a myriad my choice or a uh, uh, different lab tests, the value for the HRD positivity varies, which is 42 for the trial which is using power line trima, well, uh, it was 33 and for various Indian labs, local it is 50. So that score we need to keep in mind when we are seeing uh, whether the patient is HRD positive or not. Uh, I will skip this, we have already discussed that a lot of patients who will uh, who have high grade serious will have genetic mutations mainly in the BRC as well as HRR and these seems to be prognostic as well as predictive of response to therapy in this patient and we should try to pick up this patient to better personalize therapy in ovarian uh, cancer. Uh, so as we have seen, so the landscape for maintenance option is busy. So if a patient uh, has received bevacizumab, so how will you uh, choose between a follow one regime of bevacizumab plus uh, olaparib versus uh, olaparib alone versus arupaparib alone in a patient who is a uh, work mutation point? Anything which, uh, which can give us an answer, which can be a better regime. A BEP plus OLA, OLA alone or a UPA carry based on ethylamone. So if it is germline BRCA positive, uh, uh, though I have not tried the combination, but I would only go for OLA. OLA. So you, you are not, uh, you will not try to use both the agents up front. Uh, I don't know the correct answer of how to choose between combination versus uh, alone OLA carry if a patient is germline BRCA positive. And I don't know how much incremental benefit bevacizumab is going to add to the already uh, because the rationale for using olaparib in a germline BRCA positive mutation is due to the effect of the drug. And in that effect, how bevacizumab is going to play its role, I don't know. So there have there is some data which says that when we use uh, bevacizumab in PAP positive or germline BRCA mutation or somatic BRCA mutation patient. There is an additional effect of using bevacizumab that was the rationale behind that. And that there seems to be some editing effect which, which occurs. Yeah. yeah. That we don't know clinically that how much uh, benefit it is actually going to do. So I agree. So we don't have an answer to that. So the, so the field is open and for a trial and open some data from Asina Mono, Paula, with the OS is still pending. Will make may give us better answers to this thing. And they are studying on Nirvana, which is. Which was actually not answering. <laughs> so there is a, a trial for Nirvana which is going on, which, which is comparing chemotherapy plus Nirapari plus Bevacizumab versus only chemotherapy plus Nirapari, which will better give us an answer whether Bevacizumab adding Bevacizumab will have an additional value or not. Till that time, uh, I, I, I agree that we don't have an answer, and a single agent might be better in terms of toxicity profile and cost, cost affordability for our patient. And, uh, we yeah. have to reserve this for probably the later So, uh, how we choose between different uh, PARP inhibitors in your practice? Cost. 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 Only cost. Anything cost. to do with the side effects and all those things? Those that come second. If the patient is able to take, then only the question of side effects comes. So, 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 I will skip. So, this is the only thing. I couldn't yeah, find so anything else to differentiate. And cost seems to be the one which is driving. Although, there are some class differences in side effects, which comes up secondary in our setting. Excuse me. I have a question. Uh, most of the patient who will be able to afford any of the PARP inhibitors will have some type of insurance cover, otherwise it's very difficult for anybody. No, no insurance can cover the cost of PARP inhibitors. So, yeah, but two years, of, I don't think so. Any, yeah, insurance, any insurance, insurance would not give it. Uh, uh, therapy costing two and a half lakhs for two years. I don't so, think so. 
So this is an in-depth comparison which is there. I left it uh, because of a time constraint. But uh, if we look at a trial, so only one trial, which is a solo one for Olaparib, has a mature data for OS for five years, which even after a 40 months OS benefit, doesn't turn out to be statistically significant because most of the patients crossed over over to that thing. So I don't know we will have an answer to that thing because a 40 months benefit doesn't turn out to be statistically significant when we have weeks of Differences which turned out to be certainly significant. Athena Mono, uh, we have a PFS benefit, and uh, for Ruka the OS, OS data is still immature. And similarly, for Paula, when we don't have a long term follow up to answer that thing. So, yeah, cost is one factor. So, there are some side effect differences. So, Nara Peri, which is not available, is the most toxic of them, have the most side effects in terms of anemia and thrombocytopenia as well as neutropenia. Uh, so, a patient. Uh, who have propensity to all this, I will avoid Naraparib. Uh, Rukaparib, if a patient has deranged renal function or AST, AT elevation at baseline, then maybe Rukaparib might take a back drop and Olaparib might be a better option. But we have, when we are doing PAP inhibitor, we have to take care of and we have to keep in mind the risk of AMN and NDS, which now at five years we know that almost three to four percent of patients in some series, we will have a long term AML or MDS which is developed during therapy. So, that need to be kept into consideration. And any patient who develops a wrong anemia on any PAP inhibitor need to be evaluated with a good peripheral smear and bone marrow to rule out uh, development of AML, MDS. Those things need to be taken. So, when we will learn over time which is better. There are many overlapping side effects. Like, we really cannot choose one drug over the other. Over the distinction of these side effects. Yeah. Take home yeah. with yeah. experience, of the, experience of the clinician and uh, more knowledge to use these drugs more commonly. Uh, so uh, this one, uh, when we look at the AST AD elevation with uh, Ruka Peri, they are all transient and most of them status over three. So uh, just very quick uh, uh, cross fire or uh, rapid fire on this need for HRD testing first line ideal practical. <laughs> It should be done. It should be done because of that matter. A role of Bevacizumab in our mutant BRC quality population. Will you add? Will you, do you think a role is there or not? Okay. Uh, okay. A need for in HRD quality in white type BRC. We can use Rukasarudu. HRD first. Uh, Bevacizumab, you would want to add Bevacizumab in HRD quality? First, I would like to use a part. Okay. And uh, best option for? HR profit proliferation EOC in person. So recently we have a meta-analysis. So meta-analysis which have come up in two days back only from TMS Dr. Sudeep and Dr. Seema which have shown that uh, uh, for individual patient meta-analysis that uh, in uh, uh, HR uh, proliferation or non-HRD patient PARP inhibitors doesn't seem to be driving any benefit. So a chemotherapy plus seems to be the ideal option. So this seems to be what we are heading uh, uh, home. A lot of confusions, less of answers and more of questions which have generated. But uh, maybe further trials will help us in answering all of these questions. Uh, for us, I, will, I will skip the recurrent setting and uh, I think uh, we'll stop the panel here. Thank you and thank you for making the wait. Thanks. <laughs> Do you take platinum sensitivity as a surrogate marker for use of uh, PARP inhibitors instead of doing HRD testing? Sir, I think so in the first line almost all the patients would be responding to a platinum sensitivity is defined mainly in the recurrent setting. So we don't have, we cannot wait for that because by the time... It will be for a refractory patient probably which are very few in number. So we don't... If in case you have used it as a new adjuvant and you have achieved a very good response to the treatment, imagine from uh, uh, a very high volume disease, you have achieved a disease which is very minute of one millimeter or something like that, then would you still consider using the 
uh, sir, we are using taxi and also we don't so, know, right? So, uh, if I could answer that question, so, uh, so Athena Mono, which is a trial for uh, Ruka Parrot, has uh, shown that it, uh, it's, uh, it benefits across the group. So, we don't need HRD testing, it benefits across the group, it benefiting even the HR proficient humors which is there. Although the benefit is less, yeah, platinum sensitivity is the backbone which is showing. So, if a, if a tumor is HRD deficient, but the mechanism by which PARP inhibitors are acting, we, we know that platinum acts in the same way. So, we can say platinum are a poor man's PARP inhibitor. Exactly, that's what I was coming So So, that, that can be used. But looking at the cost of PARP inhibitors, I will say when, when asking or counseling a patient for two years of a expensive PARP inhibitors, I will like to go for a test so that I could answer the question, what is the benefit, what the magnitude of benefit which the patient will get from PARP inhibitors rather than just relying on a platinum sensitivity for this thing. Hope I answer this. I think we should wind up because we are already short of time. I'm sorry for the uh, interrupting in between. The session, the so, uh, question answers uh, can be taken up at the dinner time. So, <laughs> thank you all the chairpersons, the panelists, and uh, moderator Dr. Alok. That was a wonderful session. So, we proceed with the felicitation program. I would advise the chairpersons to please felicitate our uh, the moderator. I would request Dr. Jagdeep and Dr. Jatin Sareen to please felicitate our chairpersons. Dr. Pooja. Dr. Vijay Vansi. Dr. Dr. Sanjeev. Dr. Vansi, that's, that's 4C. Dr. Patnik. Thank you, Dr. Jagdeep and Dr. Jatin. Thank you. I would request Dr. Kunal Dhal and Dr. Manjinder to please come on the stage and felicitate our panelists. Dr. Kunal Dhal is there? And Dr. Manjinder? Dr. Priyanshu. <laughs> Dr. Kanupriya. <laughs> Dr. Sumit. Do we have Dr. Sumit? Dr. Arvind. Dr. Siddharth. <laughs> Dr. Chitrish. <laughs> Dr. Anuj Pansu. Dr. Navdeep Singh. Dr. Pavneet. Dr. 
Dr. Wickram. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, the panelists. So we come at the end of the first day of this uh, conclave, and everybody is uh, invited for the dinner at Hayat inauguration and dinner, which is going to start by 7:30 p.m. So.